the legal room voters in Lincoln County because we have been committed to education and making democracy work for over 50 years here in, in the county that we need to know more about the order of man. And so planning began, and as, as, as always, uh, it's a collaborative effort. And so we are delighted to have you here to, and the expertise that, that we have folks from across the county, from a number of agencies and community, to share information uh, about the economics of Orville Dam, past, present, and future. So we're going to have three speakers individually, and then after they are done, we will switch over to our panel. Uh, after each speaker is done, we'll have an opportunity for questions, and, and that is when we will collect them. Uh, so, are there any questions before I turn it over to our first speaker? Okay, good. So, first up, we have Matt Murray. He's a civil engineer with the Department of Water Resources, and he's going to give the history of the dam, its current recreational facilities available, and what will be useful next summer. So, please welcome Matt. See how well you guys can hear me without a mic. I talk loud, so I'm afraid I'll scream at you through the microphone. Um, I'm here to take the arrows for the department. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> I'm a local, so I had to butter you up first. So this is me and uh, my family here locally. Uh, my dad, a lot of you know my dad. He was a veterinarian here in Orville for 30 years, Dr. Ron Murray. Um, I am a CSU Chico graduate and uh, went to school here, Lost Plumes High School and all that. Uh, I started working uh, in the private industry for two years in a construction company as a project engineer. And so I had some real world experience that came over to the Department of Water Resources and uh, I've been involved with the license coordination unit here which was established uh, as a result of relicensing efforts in the early or mid 2000s. So I've been working in the recreation and land use section. So um, there's, there's just three engineers in that section, and uh, we've been working with the community. I know quite a few of you folks are already out here in the field or out, out in the audience. And uh, part of my other duties include uh, working with the emergency action plan for Orville Dam. So with that knowledge, I uh, came in with the big, huge EAP binders and was helping make some of those decisions early on. And, uh, became and was, you know, basically kind of uh, shoehorned into being the liaison officer for the department here locally with the spillway incident. So I've been working with the local county, um, all the, the county municipalities, the local utilities, everybody that we've affected with the uh, with the emergency. So uh, I've been kind of the point of contact for a lot of that that uh, effort that's been coming through. Um, and then, of course, I do have five kids, and in the middle of the spillway incident, my wife had twins. So. Uh, I did get a couple of weeks off in between long, long, long hours. So, anyway. so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the State Water Project, giving a brief overview of the whole, you know, how we fit into the big puzzle. Um, and then, uh, then I'll go specifically into our facilities here locally. Then I'm going to go into a little bit about relicensing. And then I'm going to talk about the recreation, um, you know, venues that we have here in town and then actually into some of the improvement projects that we're doing right now as a result of the spillway to try to help mitigate for some of those lost uh, facilities over at uh, spillway and in the diversion pool. So with that, I'll start with the State Water Project. So you can read my bullets. I'll read some of these bullets. Uh, some things are hopefully not going to be too laborious for you guys to read in the audience, but we're the largest state-owned and operated water delivery system in the United States. We're one of the largest in the world. There's a few other larger projects. Um, but we are a big, big, big project. Um, we serve 25 million Californians and 750,000 acres of farmland in the uh, city of California. 32 storage facilities, 21 pumping plants, four pumping generating plants, the difference between a pump and a generator. Pumping is pushing water back up over something. Generating is capturing energy as it comes down. So, uh, and then eight hydroelectric plants that's related to producing power, Hyatt power plant, Thermolito power plant, also the Thermolito diversion dam are all parts of that facility here locally. And then of course we have 700 miles of canals and pipelines which are starting to see some wear and tear because of the uh, history of the, the project being you know, over 50 years old now. And uh, there's some subsidence from groundwater pumping and things down south. So there's a lot of big, big projects for the department that are coming up with fixing the aqueduct as well. So, 
Again, uh, the project was built in the 60s. We've completed and really almost everything was online in uh, about 67, and that really was uh, keyed in by having water to start supplying the state water project. That water comes from Orville. So we are the headwaters. So some of the, the beneficial uses, this is just kind of a real basic pie chart that I'm showing that, can, that shows the competing interest for the water that's up there in the dam. Um, what I need to be clear about is that the water that's in the dam is, is actually not owned by us locally here. It is by some agencies, but there's 29 state water contractors that have water rights to that water. So that's how this, this whole you know, thing really boils down to state water, 29 state water contractors. And they're dealing with these causes. Uh, DWR is the custodian, if you will, for getting those waters to those turnouts where the water is being demanded up and down the state of California. So recreation, flood control, water supply, power generation, and in the environmental needs for the water is, those are all part of the, uh, the balancing act that the department is trying to do down in, in Sacramento. There's, a, there's an office that just worries about the power and the water demands and trying to deal with all of these different issues all the time. It's very, very complicated. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of negotiations that happen with the Bureau of Reclamation and Shasta Dam and, and Sacramento River and also the Yuba River. All of those things feed down into the Delta. They have different needs for the environment. It's very, very calm. It's not, it's not just an easy, you know, can't we save the water and pull it and leave it up here. There's needs for those water to make sure that we don't ruin our Delta and things like that. So, <laughs> so this is one of my wordiest slides, but I, I think that it's pretty good and it just kind of it, it really gives the explanation for the state water contractors. So I'm going to labor to actually read it to you. I apologize. I won't do this much. But during the 1960s, as the project was being constructed, long-term contracts were signed with the public water agencies known as the state water project contractors. They received annual allocations, specified annual amounts of water, as agreed to in their contracts. In return, the contractors repaid principal and interest on both the general and obligation bonds that initially funded the project's construction and the revenue bonds that pay for additional facilities. The contractors also pay all costs, including labor and power, to maintain and operate the project's facilities. There's 29 contractors representing the 25 million people, 750,000 acres of farmland, and uh, they're all the way from Plumas to San Diego. So our water goes all the way down to San Diego County. Um, just to be clear, the operation and maintenance of the folks that live in Orville are not being paid for by tax dollars. We're being paid for by the state water contractors and ultimately rate payers for water down in Southern California or you know between here and there that are taking water deliveries from the state. So just so everyone's clear, we're not just tax dollars. We're actually being paid for by the state water contractors. That includes our big projects. That includes all of these these big these uh, you know big fixes, things like that. They're coming from the state water contractors, not the general fund. So uh, one other big slide here is uh, power. So I know that there's you know a push here locally to try to um, try to push to get some subsidized power like some of the other local communities have. I know that that's probably a, um, a big effort that's being held by you know, quite a few. Maybe even some of our speakers will talk about that. But um, here's here's kind of how the energy is, is consumed and used in the state. So today, the State Water Project is one of California's largest energy producers and consumers. Typically, we're a bigger consumer than we are a producer. And so on the grand scale of power, we're actually selling wholesale power if we have excess. Typically, we don't have excess. It's normally about a wash. But we have a lot of really big pumping plants, specifically Edmonston down south, to get us over the Tehachapi's into LA and below. There's a lot of power and juice that goes into making those pumps run, more so than what we produce here at, at Orville. So for perspective, Orville has about a 700-foot head of water on it when it's full to the power plant. Well, down south, Edmondson's got to pump 2,000 feet high. So more effort to pump above than it is for us to even generate from down here. Just a little perspective. Um, I talked a little bit about the specifics here, but um, California ISO is the independent system operator. This is as a, they were basically brought in back during the old brownout days that we had um, as a result of kind of the Enron schemes and things like that back in the early, I think it's early 2000s. So now the wholesale power market is being controlled by a separate independent system operator. So they're the ones that are controlling who turns on what, who's turning off what in the big scheme of things. So hydropower is a beautiful thing because it's very green. But we also have the flexibility that a lot of coal fire plants and other big, big technologies don't have. We can turn on and off really pretty easily compared to what they can do. Once you get a coal fire power plant going, you want it to keep going. So 
Okay, now I'm going to get into a little more about just the local facilities. So I'm going to go down this list. So uh, the Orville Thermolito Complex is what this is known as uh, for our facilities up here in Orville and down in the after bay. This includes everything between there. Uh, we are the head works for the State Water Project, as I already said. Uh, we have seven dams locally, three power plants, and four large bodies of water. Uh, that does not include the Feather River itself. I'm talking about the Lake Orville at the top, the diversion pool, which is right below, the four bay, and then the after bay, the permalito four bay, permalito after bay. So, specifically, we have Orville Dam. So, obviously, this is the big, uh, the big dam in the area. We are the tallest dam in the United States. Um, 80 million cubic yards of material was pulled out of the clay pits and then brought up to build that dam. It's a rock and and a clay core dam, so it has a really really high impermeable core. Um, and very little seepage through the dam. I know there's a lot of efforts, or not, not efforts, but a lot of speak about you know a leaking dam and things like that. Um, so I've seen it with my own eyes that the dam's not leaking, the green spot's not green. So um, there's going to be additional you know work being done on those uh, vegetation assessments. So we'll hear more about that in the future, and and then at some point we'll have to decide if there's going to be a need for additional monitoring equipment, and surveillance equipment. So uh, just. I'm just trying to put that to bed. You guys can ask more questions about that if you want. I'm, I'm more than willing to answer anything on that. Um, again, Orville Dam is a little over a mile long. If you include the emergency spillway, that big long weir that we almost failed this last year was um, somewhere in the magnitude of about 17 to 1,800 feet long. So when you add it together, the dam and that emergency spillway is almost 7,000 feet long. So very large structure. Oh, wrong slide, so sorry. Uh, so here's where we're going back to. Um, the spillway is, is I'm going to talk about the spillway construction and, and where we're at at the end of the project, but um, yeah, just another photo, everyone's already seen this one, but some of the other photos might not be as obvious. So I'm going to talk about Bidwell Saddle Dam. So this is another high hazard dam. What declares a high hazard dam is a structure that has a, um, if, if, if the dam were to fail, it would cause damage to um, life and property, a significant portion. Um, typically, if even one person would be uh, a, a fatality of, of a dam failure, it's considered high hazard. That designation is kind of widely recognized, but FERC is our main regulator that's telling us some of these things. <laughs> so that structure is over here on this little arm of, uh, of Bidwell Canyon. So Bidwell Canyon, a lot, of, a lot of us are familiar with the marina that's there. Down at the very, very back end of that, there's actually a structure that's about 53 feet tall, and it impounds water from Orville Dam to make sure that we don't lose it out that side. Otherwise, the, the, the lake wouldn't be able to be built as high, obviously. It's a saddle dam. Um, in addition to the complexities of this dam, we also have Miners Ranch Reservoir, which is South Feather Water and Power's headwater for their, or not headwater, but that's their treatment plant and their, their basin for collecting water. Um, that's right immediately on the lower side of this dam. So this dam can actually have water on both sides of it at the same time. So it's an interesting structure. Uh, here's some pictures of it again. You can see water. We're trying to get some old photos that we had of water actually on that dam. We haven't been up that high. I don't think anybody captured any pictures recently. But um, this is right there from the Bidwell Saddle Dam trailhead. So some of us use that trailhead. Uh, this is from right at that parking area. We just did a huge improvement project there just by chance. So. Uh, Parish Camp, so I can't really get this on my original map that I was showing you this map um, because it's actually way off the chart. It's, it's way up here on the North Fork arm of the, of the lake. So I just put a different background on this just so that you can see it. And uh, it's way up here at the top. It's right at Lime Saddle. So up here is, is this is you know, Lake Orville coming way up the North Fork. They call this the, uh, uh, the North Fork arm. And this is the, um, the West Branch. And so uh, Lime Saddle Marina is right next to this dam. Here's a picture of it with the truck on it for scale. It's not a very large dam. It only impounds about five feet of water from Lake Orville should it be needed. So um, typically, we, again, we, we only see water on this just um, on really, really cold years. OK, down to the diversion dam. So the diversion dam is that uh, really beautiful concrete structure uh, that we have right up above the fish barrier dam that everyone's very familiar with. And uh, that's this guy right here. And the purpose of this dam is to allow water to be diverted out of the diversion pool back here. We can either take it out to the four bay through the, uh, what we call the power canal, or we take it right through and put it right into the, uh, the Feather River. So uh, this, this is a very large structure. It can actually overtop if it needs to in a very high flood event. So um, Now I'm talking about the four bay. Four bay is almost three miles long, four bay dam. 
Uh, the main embankment is what most people are quite familiar with now that the South Four Bay Davies area, you can see the main embankment is right here. And so the South Four Bay Davies area is uh, this little point right here. And there's a little boat ramp that goes along with it. But otherwise, that, that dam actually, if you look at this, that dam is actually really long. And it covers, um, like I said, almost three miles of length. The next dam is quite a bit larger, the Upper Bay Dam. This one's, uh, at one point in time, was the longest dam in the world. So it's actually remarkable. Um, it's similar to a levee in a sense, but it's actually impounding water, so it's not a levee. So it's considered a dam. Um, if you've seen photos of it, this is the outlet works down at the Thermalito River outlet where we dump water right into the Feather River. So. And then lastly, we have our little fish barrier dam that's so beloved by the community that everybody knows. <coughs> so this is right next to the fish hatchery, and it's kind of an iconic little structure here, just an over <coughs> overflow structure. Again, the purpose of this is to block fish from going upstream. All right, I'll talk about Hyatt just briefly. There's three t turbine units at Hyatt, three pump turbine units, in other words, turbine units that we can actually turn backwards to actually pump water back into the reservoir out of the diversion pool. Uh, we generate up to about 644 megawatts if everything's fully capacity, at full capacity and we have a high lake level. Uh, and at that, we would be moving about 17,000 cubic feet per second through structure. And uh, unit one is the first to undergo a 50-year refurb, so that's been going on before this incident, and uh, it's actually supposed to be done in March, so they're getting most of the unit reassembled. It's a big overhaul. They're redoing all of the extra equipment, the pumps, the oil exchange, everything on it is all getting re reconfigured, redone. It's a big, big job uh, trying to retrofit a, a hole, if you will, that's in the, in the deck of the structure and all the way down trying to retrofit that with new components that are up to date and have different you know, technology needs. It's, it's complicated, to say the least. Um, which leads me to, oh, actually, I'll come back to that. It leads me to Thermalito. Thermalito has been offline since we had a catastrophic fire there back in 2011. So, Steve York, uh, this was our big, first big emergency in Orville. I should say this is the second. We also had the river valve outlet issue, but I won't get into that. Um, but we had the fire in Thermalito. And uh, that, that actually melted down most of the wires and created a hazardous, uh, really a hazardous situation to even repair. And so it took about a year and a half just to clean it up and get it safe for entry without using full hazardous waste you know, equipment. In other words, we burned all the hot, the, the metals and everything else in there and put it into you know, particulate that, that was then on everything in the entire plant. So it's a big mess. Uh, this is actually a photo that was taken from, uh, the, the following day. This happened on Thanksgiving Day in 2011. So. Um, but when it's returned to service, it'll be put back in the same, same capacity as what we left it at. Um, and that's uh, 120 megawatts and 17,000 CFS. It's, it's aligned with Hyatt to be the same uh, flow rate, if you will, so that we can operate up and down and everything can move through the plant if possible. Um, so that's actually scheduled to be back in line. They've already done all the cleanup in that facility. Um, now we're limited to actually putting the units back together. Again, we're just doing the 50-year rebuild on this. Everything's brand new. They're rewiring literally every wire out of that entire plant. All the conduits, everything's being stripped all the way out. And then we're rebuilding with new equipment, new wiring. Everything's brand new. So. Okay, I'm going to talk about Berkeley license. Sorry, I'm kind of buzzing through. I had a couple of topics that, uh, <laughs> that Tony was asking me to cover, so I'm just trying to rip through these things. Um, so we have Berkeley licensing. Um, so as a dam or a, a power generation facility that produces more than about 10 megawatts, uh, we have a we have an obligation to meet a or have a FERC license. So our first FERC license was back in the 60s, and it actually ended in 2008. And uh, so as of or since 2008, we've been on what they call a uh, an interim license or just a, an annual license. Is how to refer to it. I have that depicted here. And uh, we've been at the mercy of a NIMS um, biological you know, opinion or a biop, and uh, we finally received that just this last winter. Um, had Trump not been elected, we probably would have had that FERC, um, we, we would have had a FERC commission, but uh, when, when Trump was elected, a lot of the old commissioners left office, and so that left FERC empty. And so now uh, FERC just actually was just recently fully appointed with a whole new commission and they probably have a very tall stack of things they're dealing with, including our license in that somewhere. So, um, The new license to be a 30 to 50 year term, that's standard, that's not something that we're requesting. We're actually asking for a 50 year term so we don't have to do this over and over again. Um, but that's where we're at. 
Uh, it was negotiated with about 50 organizations, agencies, and the tribes. Um, a notable hand, uh, standout would be the Butte County, um, or Butte County. Uh, so Butte County uh, pulled away from the settlement agreement negotiations, and uh, they are the non-signatory that we do not have. So there'll be some ongoing issues in trying to figure out how we can how we can come to come to meet on that. Um, just a little line here. This is what the settlement agreement. This is actually one of the, the things that they are signing off on when those 50 orgs signed off on this. The parties further agreed the settlement agreement provides sufficient key entities uh, for FERC to find balanced beneficial uses as required under Section 10 of the Federal Power Act. So that's just a quote from from the actual settlement agreement license itself. Um, I'll talk about PMEs. PMEs are so it's on the next sheet. PMEs are protection, mitigation, and enhancement. So um, I'll go back to the slide in a second because it's interesting. But um, this is a little bit more on the relicensing. There's $50 million in recreation improvements. Um, just for perspective, just as of the spillway incident, we're putting in about $30 million in edits right now. So uh, the plan with the recreation side of things is that you have what's called a settlement agreement article A127, uh, put together the recreation management plan. It's a whole book in itself. And it has all the different recreation improvements that we're going to have. And I'm going to go through a list of all the different facilities and which ones are getting upgrades. Um, what was supposed to happen is at the 12-year mark, after two FERC Form 80 cycles, uh, I won't get into that, but that's an attendance collection thing that we have to do for the federal government every six years on everything we do for uh, recreation. Uh, Kevin Zeitler is very familiar with those reports. The final reports kind of summarize those things as well. Um, but we, uh, we collect those, and we, we should be talking about the RMP every 12 years. And so basically, we, re, we do 10, 10 years of work, then we go and talk about two years um, to figure out what's going to be next. And so that's kind of where we should be, but because the license took so long, we still haven't put in most of the original license. So I know that that's contentious for the community, but we, we have to wait as a state agency to start putting together a lot of those, those efforts until we have you know, in order to do so. Otherwise, we're talking about gift of state funds and things that we can't deal with uh, legally. So, uh, some other components of this besides just the recreation, uh, 62 million was dedicated to the SDF. Uh, this is uh, basically so the city could, could define what they would like to do uh, specifically with that money without having to go through DDBR and the state to figure it out. So, uh, that was part of the state water contractors. They, they agreed to, to basically give about a million dollars a year to what's called the Supplemental Benefits uh, Fund. So some of you are familiar. I don't have a whole lot of time to go through, but if you have questions, I can talk about that afterward. Um, some other big things are some cultural protections, historic properties management plan. So um, it's, a, it's a new big venue. You had kind of the environmental push in the last kind of 30 to 50 years. And uh, one of the next ones is the cultural, um, uh, the cultural protections, you know, are a new big deal for us to see. So anything over about 50 years old is now automatically uh, protected by the state historic properties. Um, I, I don't know if it's an act or, or what the actual title of that is, but um, it requires us even to paint a building, we have to make sure we're, we're careful about affecting the quality of the history of those structures. So. Um, another big thing is skill load management. We've, we've seen some of that work that's already gone on up by Kelly Ridge and around uh, kind of the property line at, at uh, those facilities. Uh, there's a lot more of that. Obviously, that's a bigger deal than I think it used to be with some of the recent fires. So uh, the department has an obligation to continue doing a bunch of fuel load reduction around our facilities. Uh, and again, we've already started that process, and we have a lot of different contracts working with the California Conservation Corps, working with local uh, sheriffs, working with the um, oh the Butte County. What's the fire agency that's up here? Uh, not Cal Fire. It's actually a uh, what's that? Fire Safe Council. That's right. The Butte County Fire Safe Council, working with them, trying to you know, trying to work with all of our partners here locally to, to get as much done with what we have every single year. And uh, those fuel load reductions happen every single year in different areas of the of the project on our land. Um, last, there's a ton of environmental improvements up and down the Feather River. Woody debris, putting in side channels, um, some floodplain enhancements, lowering down some of the gravels that are out in the, in the uh, orbital wildlife area, um, meeting fish obligations, changing our low flow rates, changing our temperatures. So there's many, many things that affect uh, the environmental side of things. And over here, you can see kind of the breakdown of these dollar amounts. This is a commitment, so I don't want to um, persuade you that there's going to be half a billion dollars in environmental and half a billion dollars in recreation. What part of that is, is the operations of those is, is included in those costs. It's a commitment to continue to fund recreation management from fish and wildlife, 
from Butte County Sheriff's Office out at the After Bay for state parks up at the SRA, the State Recreation Area. So those also include maintenance and operation budgets as well. But there are capital improvements built into all of these quite, quite significantly. This talks about the PMEs. Again, I, I alluded to this earlier. So uh, what you're seeing up here is you have a physical PME. &E. In other words, we're actually going to be building something. So when you see P's on this map, all the P's mean we're building something or adding some facility at all of these different recreation facilities um, in Oregon. This is as a result of relicensing, just to be clear. Uh, some of these things have been implemented early. Most of them have not. Um, we're, again, we're waiting for that FERC license so we have the order to go out and do it, and then we have, then, then there's no more to get done. Um, but until then, we're, we're waiting. Um, so just to give you an idea, there's quite a few things that are coming. Um, so now I'm going to actually go through these lists as far as the recreation facilities more carefully. So <coughs> talking about campgrounds, um, I have over here, my screen's a little bit cut off on the side, but these are plan improvements that are highlighted in green, and if they're in red, that means that they're going to be out in the year 2018 because of the spillway incident. So that was part of what I was asked to try to relay to you folks is, is what we are and aren't going to have. But I also wanted to highlight some of the settlement agreement projects that are affecting these, these all of these individual locations. Also, some of those, if they're green, it could be anything to adding some picnic tables and some sand on a beach to a complete new campground or an addition of you know, boat ramp lanes, there's lots of things that could be there. There's a variety. I don't want to mislead you and think that there's an overhaul at every one of these, but about half of them are major, major improvements. Some of the other ones are fairly minor, but they are additions, and, and we'll go through those. I'm not going to I'm not gonna elaborate on the details at each site, because I don't think everyone's that familiar with them. Uh, but Bidwell Canyon is going to have a very large improvement. Lumber Creeks um, is the, the camp, these are all campgrounds here. Uh, Loper Creek, the main campground, is not going to have much of anything, but the, the group campground, we're going to add a new one. The equestrian campground is an add-on after the, the settlement agreement. It's, it's a fairly new facility that's really well received. Uh, you have the Lime Cell campground, and then you also have the group campground there. We're going to improve the campground, add another one. Uh, the spillway, there's actually a spillway RV and a route campground, so people can actually drive and park their RVs overnight at the spillway boat ramp. They can also do that at the North Portland Little Four Bay. Uh, both those facilities were not to receive any new additional upgrades, but uh, they're listed here. Uh, the Thunder River out, after, after Bay Outlet was going to have a very large campground added. It's brand new. Really, there's rural camping there right now, but it's a large facility that will be added to, with, a, with a new license. Uh, boating campgrounds. So uh, these are all the, uh, the existing boating campgrounds. Um, really, most of those things are pretty rural. Uh, you boat in, and you know the <coughs> idea is to not make big footprint when you go in, and so we don't. there's not a whole lot of facilities there other than your stoves, your flat pads, and... Um, and some restaurant facilities. That's typically what's available at those campgrounds. Uh, Foreman Creek has quite a big, quite a big build out that we're going to do up there. We also have some cultural protections that are going to happen. Uh, the rest of these are very rural. If you're not familiar with the lake, you probably don't even know where they are. Uh, and then we have 10 floating campsites. Uh, there's going to be uh, an, an additional uh, couple of floating campsites that are going to be added. These are really, really popular. Um, this is a picture of one right there. So you vote up to these things and you're really out on your own. You don't have anybody else bothering you. Those are searches you can place all throughout the lake in different areas. So you can go to the North Fork, you can go to the Middle Fork, you can go to the South Fork. Uh, they're wildly competitive to get into, though. That's the only negative. <laughs> okay, uh, boat ramps and day use areas. DUA is day use area. So this is a picture of um, Loper Creek boat ramp. Um, it's about halfway down before we get to the end. Uh, Bidwell Canyon is going to receive a bunch of upgrades. Loper Creek is going to receive a bunch of upgrades. Lime Saddle. Spillways out, obviously, right now. We don't know what the long term benefits of, or the long term um, uh, ability to bring spillway back. I know that that's a big concern from the community. It's a big concern for me since I'm part of the community, also, just so you know. Uh, we're fighting to keep spillway. We want to bring it back, but right now it's part of construction. It's just, that is the construction laid out. I have an office parked up on spillway right now. That's where I reside. So until that construction of spillway is done and we know what the long term effects are going to be from this construction, uh, we don't know if we're getting spillway back, and I know that's a really big concern for everyone. So I echo your your, uh, your frustration, and, and so does the department. We do want it back, but it just it is the logical place to have a construction set up right now. And also, we don't want to be putting traffic and people across that construction site while we're doing it. So big safety hazard. So uh, Enterprise is going to have a big extension. It's going to lower quite a bit lower. That's way up on the South Fork Farm, right next to where the uh, the Ponderosa fire was this year. North Fork, and that, that's going to have a secondary parking lot. We've kind of expanded, uh, myself and my 
my coworkers are trying to make that facility as big and, and as nice as we can so that those folks on the north side of the lake have somewhere to go. Um, the North Foreway and South Foreway, um, they're both going to have some, some uh, smaller improvements, not really big, uh, picnic tables, ramadas, sandy beaches, things like that. Uh, Monument Hill, I just recently did a project out there. I'm not seeing the new road and changing the parking lot and trying to get, we removed the fences and added more sand and beach. So those are things we've been doing outside with the license, trying to, trying to do what we can to make some improvements. Wilbur Road just had a big area that was expanded also recently just for, uh, for fishermen that really like to fish for, uh, for steelhead out of the after bay. Uh, car top boat ramps. So the diversion pool is closed right now. We're dredging the diversion pool. So uh, we have we have barges and, and big heavy equipment that are in there up and down. So we we block all access to the diversion pool. Uh, it was pretty lightly used, but um, I think that now that people have a little better idea what it is, it was really a gem of the community. That I don't think people really understood that we had available to us. It's really really pretty up there. Um, there's there's not there's really no houses or anything around. It's very rural. Uh, a lot of wildlife in the area, otters, eagles, you know, just things that we're not used to seeing in the community because it's just a, a really nice, nice area. But unfortunately, that's going to be out for next year. Um, I would think that as soon as the spillway projects are over, that those will immediately come back available. Um, Dark Canyon is a very remote facility on the lake. It's not getting any improvements. Uh, Foreman Creek is a, uh, I mentioned it earlier, there's going to be some improvements there to the, uh, to the boat ramp and to the actual uh, parking areas of the restaurant, things like that. Larkin Road down on the after bay. Larkin Road is a uh, kind of one of my little pet projects. I really like that area. It's out on a, probably the warmest water in our facilities because it goes all the way through the after bay and it's almost in a backwater area where it just really warms up. Uh, really gentle slopes so the kids are just really friendly for kids. So we're going to put a big beach out there, put some tables and ramadas and improve the parking. Uh, Nelson Park, Spring Town, Mitten Gulch, those are three fairly uh, remote car top boat ramps. There's going to be minor improvements probably in Spring Town because there's some access issues right now. Uh, the after bay outlet has a major improvement. We're going to put in a concrete boat ramp to get you into the actual Feather River. And so there's a lot of Feather River users that are going all the way to Gridley because they like the ramp facilities better. We're going to be putting in a pretty nice one up here locally, so that'll be good. And then there's multiple OWA, that's the Orville Wildlife Area car top boat ramps that are getting improvements. So minor improvements. Just kind of grading and making sure that they're still stable for everyone. And then this is my last slide on this. I'm sorry for belaboring. Um, the uh, this is our Trails and Trailheads program, so uh, right now I put a little uh, asterisk up here. The Brad Freeman Trail right now has a section that's blocked off because it's actually along the diversion pool on both sides, the high and the low side. We've got that blocked off right now because we have construction traffic, power line work, there's a lot of activity right around that trail. So, Other than that, all the rest of the trail system is accessible. Uh, there are some limitations on getting also to the uh, Potter's Ravine. Uh, you can still use Potter's Ravine Trail, you just can't access it from the spillway. That's typically where we would access it. So if you access it from the water side, a lot of people actually boat up to the edge and then they hike and then they come back and boat out. So that is one of our uses. Otherwise, uh, I'll leave this trail. There's actually 90 miles of trail in the area that uh, the DVR is in charge of, and there's, there's quite a few other trails that are also Feather Falls Trail, for instance, and there's Table Mountain Trails, things like that. But uh, 90 miles for us, and uh, we've already added on the North Fork as kind of an early action. I should also bring up that the custodians of these um, trails and also of all these facilities include Butte County uh, Sheriff's Office. Uh, they patrol and, and operate most of the after bay and the fore bay, for, uh, I'm sorry, just the after bay for us. Um, Department of Fish and Wildlife, the wardens out there enforce laws out in the Orville Wildlife Area. The uh, Department of uh, Parks and Recreation is the management agency that's in charge of the state water, you know, recreation or the state recreation area up here. Um, that includes the four bay and the south four bay, and then all the way up to the lake. So those are the three primary groups. Uh, we also have Fish and Wildlife that um, helps out at the hatchery as well as one of our other facilities. So now I'm going to talk about some of the offsets that we're doing because of the spillway incident. So there's, these are probably not as well known right now. Um, there's about $30 million that was approved um, for us to, to operate under with the rest of the state water contractors. It's actually not paid for by them. Um, nonetheless, here's um, what we're doing. I don't want to. I don't want to um, mislead you, saying that I'm adding 14 lanes. I'm, 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 that is very technical. 14 lanes. We're adding 14 lanes uh, of boat ramp. 
but they're at different elevations, so it doesn't mean you're getting 14 at one, at one elevation. So there's a, these are the different improvements that we found. These are narrow areas where we're trying to expand on Bidwell Stage 1 and Stage 2, trying to make those wider so that they can accommodate more people. Um, and then the Enterprise Road Ramp, we're going to extend that and, and add two lanes all the way down if we can. Uh, the really big one I have this thing highlighted here, uh, parking was another big issue, just so that's why I have a table here. We're adding a lot of parking facilities so that we can make sure that we're you know, spillway was 400 parking spaces on the upper deck, and uh, we lost all of those. So that's parking for tournaments, parking for visitors, all that. So we're trying, we're trying to do the best we can with what we have in a short period of time. Um, we've already done quite a few of these uh, improvements, and then the other ones are in progress. The next slide will show you where the status is on most of these. Uh, but I really want to highlight, this is a big one right here, the Loafer Creek Boat Ramp Stage 2. Um, Getting that thing pushed through was really, really big. It's not in the first license. It's not in the settlement agreement. It was kind of missed, or at least it wasn't, it wasn't um, brought up or, or echoed loud enough during uh, relicensing to, to basically be you know, carried forward. So uh, getting that done, we actually just had a perk approval to um, to do that project. So we actually have everything we need to move forward with that, which is a really good thing. Uh, then we've also put in some shovels this year, and they'll continue next year to try to make uh, getting up and down the boat ramps easier, especially at Bidwell and at Lime Saddle. Uh, it's a long hike back to get back up to your cars, and so uh, that was something we tried to do to make those things more efficient so that we can, you know, utilize them better. Uh, Bidwell Saddle Dam just had a big improvement project. I, I kind of uh, alluded to that earlier. And then uh, we're also going to try to provide some more low uh, marina access. This is something that ORAC specifically has been asking us to look into. We've been, we've been working on it, but the problem is when we, we discovered that the low water access was a really big issue during the drought. And um, by the time we got basically authorization to pursue that, um, we weren't in a drought anymore. And so we haven't seen the low water in the last two years really to be able to see it. So now that we're, we're doing this, uh, we are going to be lower water this year. I'll show the, the elevation that we're projecting. Um, that's a project that's going to be a high priority for us also. So this is the first of two slides. It has all these projects on here. This is talking about the estimated um, start time here and the estimated completion date here. Um, our goal is to have all of these in place by the end of next year. Uh, they're just feasibly full-blown full design permitting and construction window based on what, where the lake elevators are. Limit us to really, you know, only either having this winter or next winter to do it. And, uh, just it's just it's a lot of things to jump through. We have we have the blessing from most of these agencies, but there's still a lot of work to do. So uh, this is showing you we've done some of these things already. Uh, a lot of these are phased out if we could, like on these parking lots. We just we went in there, did the grading, pulled out all the trees, and uh, uh, the idea is to pave them later, put in lighting. Those phase two lighting and paving projects will happen uh, in the in the spring and early early uh, 2018. We want them ready before the rec season really starts. Um, here's the second sheet. This is another update. Again, just one of the same projects list. So this, is a, this is a separate five or six projects right here, and there are some completion dates. Um, I can I can entertain you guys later if you want to uh, see these things in more detail. Uh, here's a here's a graphic that some of us are familiar with. Um, this is actually showing uh, right here is our current elevation right now, which is on this axis over here. And this is showing all the individual boat ramps that we have. So uh, this shows you when these boat ramps fall out of access, because like these guys up here are not going to be in the water, at least during this period of time. So the time is down here on the bottom. So right now, we are about halfway through um, September. So that puts you right at the edge, of, uh, right in between these bars. So now these bars are the high and the low of what we're anticipating could happen based on water. So these are projections from our water office, if you will, down in Sacramento that are telling us about where the lake is. So this is critical because obviously the economic impacts of Lake Orville are impacted by lake levels. <laughs> so lake levels um, are projected to be very low. So just to be clear, the department's number one priority right now is making sure that the spillways project can be done safely and that any contingency can be taken to enhance safety right now, we are taking it. That includes lowering the reservoir very low. So I know that that's a very bad impact on the community, but um, I don't think that we could go next year or this winter and have an issue and wish we would have taken that extra 30 feet off of the lake. So um, they'll pull the lake down. And November 1st, we will absolutely be um, below elevation 700 
is right about here. So that's right here. You can see this number. We, we have to be down here at a minimum. And then we'll continue to lower until, the, until uh, water starts coming in from rain. So just a recap on what's available in, in 2018. Everything but the spillway boat ramp, the upper overlook and the Orville Dam that everyone's very familiar with walking. Those are both going to be still off. Uh, the diversion pool, car top boat ramp, and the day use area facility. And then access to a couple short segments of trails around the diversion pool. So everything else will be available, but I do need to caveat that boat ramp availability is based on weather. So I just showed you back on this slide right here that a lot of these ramps are going to be out of the water for parts of the year. Now, what next year looks like, how far we come back up over here, you know, if I were to continue this graph, and to see how high we're going to be, it's going to be really weather dependent. Uh, we definitely won't bring the lake over elevation 850 for sure, because that would be putting us into our flood reservation. Um, but I would project it will be much lower than that even, just based on what we can do for the spillway. If we can keep it lower, we will keep it lower. Next year, that's the unfortunate reality of, of the spillway project for sure. The, the economic recreation impacts. So. Okay, now I want to talk about the recovery project. So this might be a little more interesting. Um, this is actually us trying to rebuild the spillway. That's what this is called. The recovery project. I'm doing on time. I'm probably going way too slow. We're a little. How much longer do you have left? I, uh, I will go through this in five minutes. Okay. okay. Sure. All right. Well, there's plenty of time for some questions. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, okay, so the objectives of the emergency recovery. So ensure public safety and integrity of the normal dam and associated facilities which include both spillways. Get the spillway able to pass 100,000 CFS this next November, on November 1st of this year. Keep it on, on uh, pace to do that still. And uh, can start to cut off all below the emergency spillway so that we have a backup redundancy, uh, redundancy if we absolutely have to. We have no intention of doing that, just to be clear. So uh, right now, this year, I just want to be clear, this year, we're going to replace this part. This is a finished section. The very top we're leaving in place, you know, they did a bunch of core samples and it's like five to seven feet thick of concrete. It's much heavier than what we saw fail down here. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna be 870 feet of finished concrete. This is the roller compacted section that you see. That's not gonna have a finished um, deck on the top. We're actually keeping it a little bit low and next year we'll add the finished deck on it. It is capable of handling up to 100,000 CFS this next year. That's the limitation. This right here is already ready to go back to full capacity. Or it will be, and this is this will also be at the very bottom. Next year, we'll come in and we'll finish the whole thing with structural concrete over the top of that middle section. <coughs> just to be clear. Um, right now, you can see this is a, just a couple pictures of the demolition. We've all lived a lot of these photos. Um, there's two batch plants on site. We're producing our own concrete. We're actually crushing all the material we pulled out of the channel, recrushing it, using it in, in the concrete mix. Um, that's associated with this RCC plant over here, big, big plant. Uh, then all the rest of the concrete comes from our other plants on the top of the hill, or uh, even from Matthew's ready mix here, they're, they're getting quite a bit of work from us. Uh, a couple photos just to show you the foundation cleanup. I mean, this is really, really hard work. Um, they literally go through the shop backs, and they pick up every single pebble and grain of sand. It's absolutely remarkable. They want the bond. We want the bond of that rock and the concrete. Uh, this is leveling concrete, so they put these same place forms up here, and uh, they actually, that's where all the drain lines are going to go afterwards, so they had to leave a void there so they could put the drain back in afterward, but we need to get the concrete void. Uh, this is starting to show some of the, the actual final deck, if you will, and the final um, placement of the concrete. That'll be the surface that actually can have water on it. This down here is just a, the, the foundation, if you will. These are all rock anchors. You can see these little, these little guys that are poking up. Uh, this this cut photo is a couple of weeks old now, so that area is much, much further along. Uh, those are the walls. You can see these walls are five to five feet at the base, a little over five feet, and they taper up to about two feet. Um, double rebar cages on those and on the deck below. The reason this rebar is green is it's been epoxy coated, so it's very, very water and chemical resistant. Um, this is a conceptual construction design of the emergency scoey. So the emergency scoey is up here. Here's all the concrete we blew in there during the winter or during the spring. And uh, now we're going to put in an underground wall um, right, in the, or right below the structure, about 700 feet down. And uh, that wall, what that does is if this is the lake over here, this is the emergency spillway, we'll come down on an armored surface. This is all going to be roller compacted concrete. And then 700 feet, 30 feet below, there's going to be this cutoff wall that goes into the ground. 15 feet in the bedrock is the minimum, or 10, 15 feet, I think, 10 feet minimum. 
And then if we ever had erosion, then at this point, this would be the natural topography or the natural ground again. If the water rolls over this, it would erode and it would run into this wall, which is embedded in the bedrock this time. So. Here's the drill rigs that are doing that work. They actually drill holes right next to each other that overlap just a little bit, and then they backfill that hole with, or that, that whole wall with concrete. Then there's uh, reinforcement cages. Recovery, there's also a couple other things that are going on. Recovery, dredging the diversion pool. We're trying to get all the material out of the diversion pool. Picture's not that great. Uh, power line realignment is actually almost done. We're about to energize the new realignment, which uh, takes us out of this whole way. We were basically kind of horseshoeing around the entire spillway area so that if we ever had a problem, we wouldn't tie Hyatt to the spillway ever again, if there was ever an emergency. So. Uh, future projects. These are just a couple that you know come to mind for me, environmental. Are we going to have big environmental remediation projects coming down the pipeline? Probably to some extent. I don't know how big they'll be. They might be huge. Um, levy improvements downstream, whether the department is directly responsible for those or the local maintaining agencies are, yet to be determined, but uh, potentially that, that, that could be echoed as a result of this. Um, and then additional outlet structures. These are big things that a lot of folks are concerned with, and so is the department, so is our regulators. Um, this highlighted, you know, we lost Hyatt, we lost the spillway, we lost the emergency spillway, and we lost the river valves. We lost all four ways to safely release water out of our out of our lake. So those are absolutely concerns of us, concerns of the community, They're not being lost. There's a lot of work that needs to happen on this. Trying to figure out if, if what type of outlet or if an outlet you know is, is going to be serviceable. So uh, with that, I think uh, I just wanted to highlight right now, he was working 24/7 to make sure that we're done and safe, and. Uh, just another little tidbit that I heard yesterday, finally. 88% of the craft workers are considered local. So just so you know, so big impact, but it's local. It's happening from the labor unions that, you know, that are down here and between here in Sacramento. Uh, that's what local kind of means, I think, for, for construction. So. And then I'll leave this up for a minute or two or we can pull it up later, actually, so that the next speaker can get going. Sorry, Claire. Okay. All right, ready for questions? I'll just leave this up for you can certainly leave it up for questions. Thank you, everyone. I'll take some of the cards while others are being painted. Okay. I just, I just grab one at random. Um, if you're, if I come on a card that's repeated a question from earlier, obviously that I won't repeat the question. So, okay. Um, will DWR be assisting the economic enhancement needed to the rest of the state? PSAs, for example, that Orville is safe, and then there's a second part, if needed due to another high rainfall, snow, winter, will the spillway be usable without destroying the work done so far? Let me start with the second one because that's easier, then I'll go back. Well, the first one's easy, too. I, I will absolutely support um, with work that's going up and down the state, you know, to, to ensure that we're a safe community to work in, to play in. Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's our fundamental message as well, so there's no doubt that, you know, we'll help with that. Um, as for the, the fear that if we have a massive rainstorm and we would have to use the, the spillway, yes, the spillway will handle all flows this year if we absolutely had to. Uh, we want it to go to 100,000, but if it goes over 100,000, it will actually overspill onto part of the that canyon that was created. So they left the wall low on those sides right there in the roller compacted area, so that if we had to, even in the extreme emergency, it could still be used. It would not destroy the structures that have been put in place. Uh, that concrete's now eight, about eight feet minimum uh, in all the areas that we've put any concrete down, just for perspective. Eight feet being taller than me, so. Question. Okay, so another card just at random. Um, off Cherokee Road by the diversion pool, looks like someone is building a new mountain. Where are the materials coming from and how much material is there now? Will that mountain, in quotes, be permanent? Okay, so that's referring to uh, one of our stockpile locations uh, for the dredging that's coming out of the diversion pool. 
Um, this area is down right next to the Diversion Dam. There's an elevated area that uh, DWR used to have as a kind of a storage area. Um, so we use that kind of flat open terrain for storing extra um, dirt and gravel that was pulled out of the river from the spillway. Uh, the long term plan for that I think is yet to be determined, but I do know that um, they are working to stabilize that at least for this winter to make sure that we don't have runoff. Um, and then um, if, if we have questions about what the long term uh, viability or what we're, what we're planning to do with that material right now, uh, I'll be sure to get back to you. I think that the rumblings are is we're going to crush that and use it in the concrete mix. We're going to sift through it, crush it, and then use it. So that's the, that's the plan is to use everything we have. I think the total volume down there never got over about, I want to say it was about 300,000 um, cubic yards of material. So um, of the 2 million, roughly 2 million yards that came out, uh, that was a smaller section. But that's, they've been barging all of that material. This is a question on worker safety regarding the blasting, grinding rock, blowing rock, and asbestos protection because the rock contains asbestos. Um, I could talk to asbestos uh, lightly, I'm not the expert on that, but uh, they did find that some of the serpentine rock that we're encountering um, does have naturally occurring asbestos in it. Um, they have monitors set up as a perimeter all the way around. So in other words, they're stationary little uh, little robots that are that are basically sucking in air and monitoring it continuously. And they go out and they check those things to see if there's any uh, asbestos particulates in it. Uh, to date, there hasn't been any hits. Or I think there's been maybe like one, but they actually did, they can differentiate if it was that from or from the naturally occurring versus from you know brakes from cars. That's, that's another place that old cars still have asbestos in the brakes, and so uh, it's. But uh, what I can say is that the asbestos rating on the, on the facility has been lower than a schoolyard requirement, so just for perspective. And then there's monitors and perimeter around the whole site. Okay, so there's a specific question on a particular roadway. So many local people use one mile roadway over the face of the dam. What will be available next year for walkers, bikes, roller skaters? Yeah, so I absolutely understand. I used to walk the dam myself with my kids and family. And, Take the dogs up there. Um, the dam face, or the actual dam crest road is being used for construction. It's really busy up there. Uh, I drive it every day. You wouldn't want to be on it. Uh, lots of big heavy trucks and they're, they're parked on it to, to stage different equipment. Um, it will not be available this next season for sure. Um, after that, I would presume that we'll be able to get it back open uh, at a minimum, at least for pedestrian use. I don't know what the long-term vehicle access will be. Uh, that's a Homeland Security potential question even. Um, but uh, we're fighting for it locally as far as our recreation unit. We want to get it back open. So, uh, as far as alternatives. Okay. Check. As far as the, um, I'll, I'll just recap that real quick. The Spillway Crest Road is not going to be accessible next year for walking. Um, I totally understand. I, I, I use it myself, but uh, there's a lot of construction traffic up there on the dam itself. Um, the alternatives are going to be probably uh, using areas that are not nearly as, as uh, beautiful to walk on. Uh, we have the other levees, uh, the other dams that are in the area, or I would recommend talking to the Feather River Rec and Park District because they have some other walking areas that they can provide too. Okay, here's um, a general DWR question. What is DWR going to, uh, I'm assuming we're due, should be going to do to approve inspection of dams slash the way in the future? I don't know if you're responsible for this answer, if you have the scope of um, As far as the long-term monitoring, obviously um, the visual inspections were not enough to catch this. That's something that the forensics teams also identified as a, as a, as a failing of our existing inspection protocol. And th this is kind of an industry-wide thing. This is not just here. This is just kind of what everyone has done for a long time. There's new technology that I think is going to be required to inspect these. Uh, the state has used that. Uh, ground penetrating radar being the number one, you know, simple way of actually doing an underground analysis of what's going on. But even some of those inspections may not catch it. So um, I, I would presume that the department's going to be looking into the recommendations from the forensics team, um, specifically into what would we do to rebuild a facility today that was, um, you know, comparing our design standards today to how we actually, or what we have on the ground right now. So that's, that was the forensic team's major recommendation. And that's a, that's a national and international kind of recommendation. Okay, I'm gonna combine two because I think they're similar. Um, this first one is about economic losses and current spillway repair costs. 
um, for the ramp access issues, who pays water contractors, and then there's a second one that is concerning motivation to actually truly fix dam issues versus least cost slash greatest profit. They also reference water contractors, um, and it's an example of failure to maintain hydro pumps and water flow measures initially installed. That's a hell of a question, but um, I'll start. Um, the, I, I think that the, um, man, I'm, I'm already losing my train of thought. Can I see it so I can yeah. just try to get pieces of it? <laughs> okay, so talking about the economic impacts, um, who's paying, um, who pays the contractors? I can, I can address that. I don't know if this mic's cutting in and out. So uh, rate payers pay the state water contractors ultimately. Um, state water contractors basically funded the state water project and so they are in effect a, a kind of ownership or a financing you know, component of, of ownership of the state water project. Um, they have rate payers, in other words, people that pay their water bills ultimately are the ones that are paying them. Uh, they also take out investments. They have different ways that they make money in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, as far as who's paying for our facilities, uh, I'll just recap that really quick. FEMA, uh, we're hoping that FEMA is going to reimburse um, what we can from, from the spillway emergency and uh, what FEMA can pick up or doesn't pick up, uh, the state water contractors will be responsible for. So it's not coming directly out of tax dollars, but in the end run it could be rate payers or it could be investments that the state water contractors you know, make up and down the state. second one was motivation to actually truly fix it versus uh, money. So just to be clear, the state doesn't make money on the state water project. I know that people may not understand that, but we ultimately charge the state water contractors um, what we, what we, what our costs are to operate and maintain and to deliver water. So we're the custodians, we're the drivers of the car, they own the car in a sense, right? And so this DWR doesn't have a financing component of that, I would say that maybe maybe the bigger limitation might be on you know workforce. Uh, we have a lot of people though, so um, I, I, I just to me I don't I don't feel like that's a problem. Um, I don't I just personally as a as a department employee and nobody's been guiding this this you know message for me, but I don't think that there's a uh, financial you know component of us not doing work directly um, all the time. So it's just it's not something that I see in day to day work up here at facilities at Orville Dam. So I don't operate, you know, typically we, we do have budget restrictions on certain components of our work like recreation and some of the other impacts, but as far as O and M for dam safety, things like that, I don't want to say the budget's limitless, but if there's a if there's a strong recommendation and the, the, that's the best practice, I believe the department will follow through. So So we're only gonna do one more question, um, but because we want to get to the next speaker. But Matt is going to, he'll be here and we'll see if we can return because there was a lot of questions and um, a lot of great questions. So uh, this next question, it, it, it's not actually that long, it just looks long. It's okay, don't, don't be afraid. <laughs> um, hoping for good news, when PG&E transmission line realignment is completed, can you please reopen the trails on the south side of Diversion Pool? Before February 7th, there were four trail corridors below the dam. And how about reopening Oro Dam East? It's a big inconvenience for Kelly Ridge. I'm a huge proponent of reopening Oradale East. Those of you that have been in the meetings that I hold myself for working with the local agencies, I push for it. Um, there's pushback from the construction side because there's safety, safety issues that they've had with all the construction going on on that road. I do drive the road regularly. You don't want to be on it right now. Uh, you definitely don't want to go out there with your kids and get out of the car and look at anything. Um, those are some of the concerns that we um, as the engineering team and, and on the communication side, we're afraid to open that road um, and open it up for public safety risks. So as soon as the, the power lines work is done, uh, that's about to be reevaluated here shortly because the power lines are, are you know, nearing completion and then they'll have some cleanup work and then we're hoping we can get the trails and the road opened. So I'm crossing my fingers that we'll be able to do that, but again, I gotta work with the construction side, Keywit, they have access to that road if they need it. Uh, so does the dredge crew, so um, they, they need their staging area and their access routes as well for safety, so. Great, thank you. So, thank you, Matt. <laughs> so now we're gonna switch over to Brian Ring. He is the Butte County Assistant Chief Administrative Officer 
and he'll give an overview of the ongoing economic impact uh -huh. on Butte County government agencies as well as those related to the spillway crisis. So this presentation will be coming out shortly. First six years with the county, so I have a lot of experience from the personnel perspective. And about a year ago, I moved into the role of assistant chief administrative officer. During this time, I've been exposed to a lot of things, learned a lot. Certainly, this has been one of the issues. Obviously, last uh, last January, February, where we this became a, a hot topic for everybody from the county. And I spent a lot of time with uh, Supervisor Connolly, uh, our county council, Bruce Alpert, just to get myself up to speed on some of this information. Hopefully, I can share with you folks today. Um, the presentation that we have here today is really, a, most of it's a recap of what, again, a lot of efforts have been put into place here uh, by our county council, Bruce Albert, and a lot of credit goes to Supervisor Connolly. Um, a lot of this information is, frankly, this information is all factual information that's been pulled from documents from over the years. Um, it's an emotional subject. I get it. I think everyone from gets it. I'm trying to, I, I, what I want to do today is just present about the facts and, and not try to get on the, uh, the emotional side. But again, it, it does, it's, it's natural to get emotional when you see some of these, this information. Um, again, I hope, I hope to get a little history about the, uh, the dam. Again, I think Matthew did a great job just giving some of the, the, the basic, the, the specifics on the dam, the water project. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of the facts on some information. Background, uh, again, some of this is a little bit redundant from what Matt, Matt spoke about. Oracle Dam 700 feet tall is, is the tallest dam in the United States. Uh, many of the, again, there's there's issues that were spoken about, some of the goals and objectives of having this, this dam, the, the, I'll call it the project. Uh, managing water supply, flood control, flood control even downstream, and generation electricity, high electricity. Just a little more specific information on this. Again, this is a little bit redundant, but the water supply again is over 755,000 acres of water going out to for primarily for irrigation in the San Joaquin Valley. It also provides a tremendous amount of water. 25 million people are getting uh, water from the various 29 uh, water contractors that are uh, that are involved in this project. As far as flood control goes, the project was designed to really help uh, flood control. You know, there's there's supposed to be levels maintained within the dam to allow capacity for high water arises during the, during the winter time. Obviously this has a lot of, uh, I think it has a lot of benefits, uh, again, downstream. What does it do for us here locally? I think, I've heard arguments it makes more of a water flood hazard as, as we saw in the last, uh, the last year. Hydroelectricity, the DWR, uh, again, they operate in license 762 megawatts. Uh, the hydroelectric project, again, I think Matt did a great job identifying all the different uh, power generating facilities within the project. Uh, primarily, as you mentioned, most of it's used to, to pump the water down, down through the system and there's a little bit of excess available at times. It, there's some facility the end of the, of the power. And as far as the first licensing goes, we'll touch a little bit on this. Uh, but again, as they mentioned, they're in, in the process of trying to, it's, it's been a year to year contract now, I think for about 10 years or so. A little information about uh, pre-dam. So before the dam was constructed, the Big Bend Power Plant opened back in 1908. That was one of the largest power generating hydro power facilities west of Mississippi back way back when. Uh, this facility obviously it provided revenue, sales tax revenue, uh, property tax revenue for the county in excess of half a million dollars, 500, 600 thousand dollars a year. Butte County received uh, also before the dam. There's about 41,000 41, acres that have now been inundated or basically underwater now uh, that the county received property taxes on. Uh, this is a quote from FERC back in 1994. Farms, mines, homes, roads, schools, trails, Circle Pass were inundated when the when the dam was constructed. Constructed and the uh, the land obviously was inundated to, to create the lake. Another quote here, provision will be made to make payment or, re or to replace improvements destroyed or injured by the proposed works. This was in the, uh, the original license documents. And to date, there's been no provisions made for the loss of revenue for Big Ben, loss of property tax revenue that the county lost with the inundation delay, um, and other costs that are associated with the project, which we'll go into again here in a little bit.
sure some of you have heard uh, the promise of the, the there's a, uh, been a lot of discussion on promises that were made when the dam uh, was constructed and really when the state water project was being pitched with Proposition 1 way back in, I think it was the 1960s, uh, maybe in the 50s. Um, but with this, U County was one of the, U County was the only county in the North State that actually supported Proposition 1, if everyone remembers that. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with uh, some things that were <coughs> promised or in, that were going to be, that this, the, the creation of the dam was going to bring to U County. Uh, jobs to be generated, obviously, jobs constructing the dam, absolutely. Uh, there's, there's a tremendous amount of work right now being done. I think 500 employees now working on the project, so there, there's certainly some economic uh, benefits of having that this dam created and, and built in Butte County. Um, economic development, obviously that, uh, I think that really ties heavily into recreation, tourism, um, which then would lead to potentially more jobs. Again, robust recreation. There was, there was talk about low cost energy for residents um, and maintenance of roads for recreation. Access to Lake Orville, Craig Access Road is one that I've, I've heard spoken about quite a bit. Um, there are promises of over a million tourists a month to, that would come to Lake Orville once it was fully developed and all the recreational facilities were, were built. And right now it's about 1.7 million tourists about a year that could that go to the lake. Some other things that were mentioned, a uh, pretty expansive lodge, a railroad model trail to, to Kelly Ridge, a tram, a pretty robust visitor center uh, with, capacity, with a restaurant capacity of 200, uh, 200 folks, and tours of power plant bus service to and from. So again, those were were those a lot of the things I think that really impacted the excitement uh, and frankly the, the voters supporting the construction of this dam way back when it was initially constructed. So this is a lake level, and, and this is one where obviously the, the lake level has a significant impact on recreation. I think the slide that Matt showed earlier was showing how the at various elevations when the, when the lake level is high, there's a tremendous amount of, of boat access, uh, the ramps that are available. And unfortunately, with uh, lake levels, here's just a couple pictures back, and these, these are taken from 2009. Um, but as that lake level drops, the access to the Lake drops significantly. And here's some shots from 2014. So, anyway, when the water level is obviously that low, it's going it's to impact the, the recreational use of the lake. Some information on a, a 1994 FERC order. This was a, an order which was done by FERC to um, enhance some recreational projects that were initially actually in the initial uh, license of the project. Um, FERC concluded that, that there, was, there was numerous things that were, that were included in the project that weren't done. So just, these are some facts, some specific information on some things that were supposed to be in place and, and this is general fact of what's in place right now. Um, by 2018, there were supposed to be close to 3,000 campsites around the lake. I believe there's about 357 right now. 108 boat launching lanes, and there are 38, 34 I think now when the lake is full, uh, 19 when the lake is down 100 feet, uh, but unfortunately eight of those lanes are at the spillway right now, which unfortunately is, is rightfully so, it needs to be shut down at this point in time for the construction. Um, other facilities that were expressly in place in the, in the 60s, numerous beaches, tremendous amount of parking, uh, picnic sites, uh, and again, more parking. Those were all supposed to be done by uh, the late 60s. Again, this map is very, very hard to read, but uh, all the areas in yellow give you some ideas about where there's supposed to be recreational facilities, uh, campsites, uh, beaches. Um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a very expansive and robust project. Back in 94, before FERC uh, made an order, uh, there were thousands of protests, common letters by folks within the community. Uh, DOA's response at the time was that the facilities 
hadn't developed as anticipated, thus impacting the, the uh, lack of expansion of the, the recreational facilities that were, in, that were initially in the license. Was the Chamber of Commerce just quoted, the Oral Chamber of Commerce quoted that the uh, local dispute suffered before recreation development at the project. And a quote from FERC here at the time is that the cost is not unreasonable given the magnitude of the economic benefits the licensee realizes from the project. So FERC did order more recreational facilities to be expanded upon and built back in that 1994 order. Just a little bit of information again on the, the background on the, on the cost to the county that for in support of the, of the, of the dam and the project. A few county provides services including police, fire, rescue roads, traffic, and it's been estimated those costs are right around $5 million. That's the county's estimated figure there. And the property tax loss, the, the revenue loss from the, the property tax that now is underwater in 41,000 acres is somewhere in the neighborhood of $6.97 million. So the overall economic cost to the county on an annual basis has been estimated to be somewhere about $12 million. That's, I think this is, this is an, obviously a, a key issue, as Matthew mentioned, that, that Butte County still has not signed on to the, the Berkeley license. This is, this, is, this is a key issue for the county to, a hurdle we need to get over, I think, in, in this process. Um, the project does not bring uh, the tourism dollars. It hasn't brought the tourism dollars that uh, were initially discussed way back when. Hasn't provided low cost power for Butte County residents. And you know, again, I've heard many people argue that it's probably created a higher flood hazard for us if we're living in the community. <clears throat> this is some, some assessments that uh, FERC made. And again, this is the, this is the, uh, does not include property tax. These are the estimated costs for the, the, the annual operations of support the, of the reservoir, the dam. Again, Butte County's our costs that, that have been that have been calculated are somewhere in the neighborhood of five million dollars. Uh, DVR acknowledged that it's about one point seven million in their estimates, and FERC also has estimated the cost to be about one point seven. So there's there is an acknowledgement that there is there is cost that the county is putting out there on an annual an annual basis to support this project. Obviously, there's a difference in opinion with one point seven five million, but there is a acknowledgement that there is a cost. FERC also stated that the estimate of the, the property tax loss from the county states that the revenue in the range of 1 to 6.9 million annually are reasonable estimates. So again, that's some evidence that there is a there is an acknowledgement that there is a cost or there's lost revenue that the county has taken on based upon this project. This is an interesting slide that was put together. Just to kind of give a comparison with some other projects throughout the United States, uh, water projects that FERC has dealt with, and what some of these projects give back to the community. And I'll just focus on focus, focus on Dam here a little bit. Uh, annual tax or other payments made to the host community, they are receiving some funds. Um, low cost power, they're not receiving low cost power. Uh, special payments benefits given local to local Payments given to address local needs, they are receiving something there. Um, unneeded project lands, return to the community, no. Uh, monies committed to road infrastructure, no. And I have a little more information on both of these, uh, on, on the Shasta project and also on the uh, Niagara project. You can see Niagara project has received a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, offsets, so to speak, from the, uh, the folks that are, that are operating that project. And you can see the bottom there for for the Orville project, but it's it's pretty much been it's been held across the board. Just a little more information on the, on the Folsom Dam project. Initial payment of close to five million dollars from the Borough Bureau of Reclamation was given to Sacramento County for its sheriff operations. They've also agreed to spend over five million dollars annually to compensate Sacramento County Sheriff's Department for providing security for the dam. They've been able to hire 31 new security personnel to guard Folsom Dam seven vehicles. Overall, it's about $28 million over a five-year period has been committed to assist with the operations of that facility. 
from the Niagara Project, and this is what I can, I won't go into all the details, but there's a tremendous, you can see there's a tremendous amount that was given back to that community um, as a settlement for the, for the operations of that facility. So today there's been numerous attempts to negotiate. I mean, this has been going on, you know, far before my time in the county, far before I think Matthew's time with DWR. It's been going on for a number of years. Um, the county has been forced to file an intervention with FERC. So basically, the where it's, where it's at right now is frankly it's in the courts, it's in the court of appeals, and I think there hasn't been a full FERC board up until recently. So we'll see what happens now if uh, that progresses. Um, and really, any issuance of a new license that doesn't address some of these challenges that we're talking about here today from the county's perspective, I don't think the county's going to, the county needs to have to see some movement on these areas before the county's going to agree to a, <coughs> a sign off on it. This is some information on where it's at with regards to the, the court cases itself. This was a, this was a quote from a with a flood control issue back in 2005, um, which this caused some concerns from some of the staff with regards to a, a letter sent by Sutter County uh, regarding that funding be included in the FERC license for flood control. Because again, that was one of the issues that was talked about at the very beginning of the presentation is that you know, part of the, the idea of having the reservoir there is for obviously water supply, flood control, and hydroelectricity. Um, at the time, though, the, the head of the license program wrote that relying on individual licenses proceedings to resolve regional flood control issues can be problematic. Um, also stated that uh, Corps Engineers has exclusive jurisdiction over flood control. Flood control operations were not included in the analysis associated with us with, with uh, seeking of a new license preferred. This caused some concerns. Flood control certainly needs to be, needs to be factored in. Some photos here, I think some of these are, are some that, that uh, you know, I think everyone's seen most of these, but every time I look at them, it, it just gives me, uh, it's just amazing the, the magnitude of the structure. Matthew mentioned eight feet in concrete now from the, uh, this, this, this structure is, is ginormous to say the least. You can see that's where the, uh, the hole started to, that was the first day when it started to, to all part of better terms. There's some pictures here that's got some tremendous magnitude of this. Uh, there's the lake level there. It's just a, a tr tremendous structure. Here's a picture, I think. You can see right here is a helicopter right there. This gives you a perspective of how big this, this project really is. This one's a gives a pretty good scale too. Those are the teeth at the bottom of the Spillway, and there's there's employees down there working on it. It's a huge, huge structure. These are some figures. Again, this presentation was given by our uh, <coughs> county council, who's out back in April. At the time, it was estimated about five million dollars a day was being spent on the construction of the, of the project. And I'm not sure if that's changed at all. That was an estimate that was thrown out around back at, at that point in time. And some estimates also were about two hundred million dollars for the emergency response as of March. Again, I'm sure these figures have changed a little bit since then. As far as the, the incidents and the impacts on Butte County itself, uh, the county itself, we closed our offices that uh, Monday and Tuesday, and the uh, the event happened on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, tremendous amount of hours were spent in a. Emergency Operations Center. For those of you who don't know, the, uh, the county, all county workers are emergency service workers, and when there's issues such as this, we open up the Emergency Operations Center to do everything we can to provide support and assistance to all the agencies that are cooperating in, in the event. A lot of the stuff that we do is try to find help people get shelters, give them supplies and everything out to the folks that need that. But the, we had our EOC, I believe it was open until Wednesday or Thursday of that week, but the county offices were closed for that Monday and Tuesday. And obviously, there's been a tremendous amount of road damage uh, with the incident itself, and then also there's been there's going to be road damage just with the construction project that's going to be going on for the next couple of years. This is just a rough estimate of the costs to the county so far. 
uh, two days lost wages, somewhere in the neighborhood of $665,000. Wages in support of the event, a lot, again, a lot of that's in our, in our law enforcement, over a million. Sheltering costs. Transporting housing and inmates. I don't know if everyone knows this, but the, the county jail was in the evacuation area, so all those inmates needed to be transported to Alameda County, which was, a, frankly, a, an incredible effort by our sheriff to be able to coordinate that in such a short period of time. A mutual aid, and then, again, road damage, and that's, I think, uh, the county and DWR are still working on this figure, but it's believed to be in the, in the neighborhood. It's, it's going to be millions of dollars. How much it is, I think, is still being uh, determined. But I did talk to a public works director, and he, he mentioned he was over 30 miles of roads that were damaged. And that's just during the first 60 days of the incident. That, that's not the, the recovery efforts. Some of the things that we've heard, this is a result of the spillway crisis, is that, you know, damaged public trust, the safety issues, is, is, is Butte County a safe place to, to come? Is Butte County a place safe to, to recreate? Is Butte County a safe place for tourism? Is it, safe, is it a good place for business? And I'm really looking forward to seeing this presentation here in a little bit about from the Orville Chamber's perspective, because I think they have a better pulse on the, the uh, interaction with the, with the local business community. Um, Expenses uh, associated with emergency services, evacuations, uh, it's had an impact on our water supply, fisheries, recreation, tourism, a lot of these we touched on already. So 15 years or so into the whole relicensing project, um, the county believes that, that the URF has not lived up to the terms of the original license and hasn't given an indication that it's going to do so in the future. There's concerns that DWR refused to acknowledge what other licenses have provided for host communities. Again, we talked about the Shasta project, a little bit about the Niagara project. The county feels that it's ultimately the status quo whereby taxpayers are subsidizing this from a safety perspective on any basis of property tax loss revenue. This is something that, again, needs to be addressed in the future, the county's committed to seeking a just result that can be achieved, hopefully through some sort of settlement with FERC. Um, but again, right now, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's an importance of pending right now. And here's some information that I know they provided. Um, a lot of folks, if you said, well, who do we go to? Would we contact at FERC if we wish to reach out to them? So here's some information uh, from, from the community both secretary of FERC and her contact information if folks wanted to, to reach out to them. That's all I have. Again, I, I understand this is a, like I said, when you see these, this information, I know when I first saw it, I, I, it, it, it gets your emotions going. The intent here isn't to get emotions going. The intent here is to share some information, um, the county's perspective, what the county hopes to achieve during the next, during the whole relicensing project, the next steps here. And um, I think, I know speaking with Matt, I think we're all hopeful that uh, something can be resolved here. Great, thank you. I see some cards coming up. Okay. Um, all right. First question, Orville City has, just making sure I can get the path of the sentence, okay. Orville City has expensive water rates and receives nothing from the dam. Has there been any thought by DWR slash Oh, no. Um, what do you think that says? Contracting agencies, thank you. Uh, to share with Warville, to say thanks for the risk of living in the path of inundation if dam fails. <laughs> Teamwork. Teamwork. We'll do this together. I just want to be clear, Cal Water is, uh, they're one of the water rights holders, so they receive water from the, from the reservoir above. Um, along with a lot of local ag, you know, there's, there's, it, this is a water rights issue you're talking about. It's a pretty big, deep water law. I mean, Brian is a, on that side of the fence, can probably talk about that a bit. But, um, I think that ultimately those utilities are, are really where we're at right now. If, if that's going to change in the future, obviously DWR is going to have to be a part of those conversations, and state water contractors certainly. 
don't know if that's an answer or if that's just an explanation of kind of where we're at. Okay, next question. Um, even assuming that Orville Dam isn't contributing economic benefits to the local community, is it fair to say that the overall benefits to the entire state of California still make the dam a valuable project? Certainly, I think that's the, uh, everyone has their own individual opinions on that, but I certainly providing water, obviously when this project was, uh, was put in place back here, a lot of work done this in the 50s and 60s just to, to analyze it. Again, it's, it's one of the biggest projects, if not the biggest project for, from a state water perspective. Um, you know, providing that water to areas that have, that have less water, Southern California certainly, the, the, uh, the farmers down in San Joaquin Valley, I think, uh, obviously we realized that when everyone started to settle in California, a tremendous amount of uh, the weather brought people here, the gold rush brought people here, there's a lot of beautiful things about it brought uh, folks to California. So the dam absolutely has a tremendous value to the state of California. My okay, next question. Uh, regarding annual costs on, costs or loss to county, um, for example, uh, several million, oh golly, fire and, I'm sorry if I can't read your handwriting, um, is DWR refusing to pay um, or uh, refusing to bill water contractors for this expense? Okay, so far there's been no provisions provided in the county, and it's one of those things where I think Matthew did a good job explaining it. Obviously, DWR operates the rest of the, that operates the project, the contractors pay, uh, but in order for the county to recover some of its costs, we have not been able to reach an agreement with DWR to cover those costs thus far. Okay. This next question um, says, I recall Lamalfa saying at the February press conference that the whole fault and responsibility of the dam was DWR, parentheses, state agency, and the federal government had no say or play in what was going on. Is this true? Isn't FERC a federal agency? FERC is a federal agency. They, they are the license. They, FERC is the issues a license to DWR to operate the, the reservoir. I'm not sure if that answered the question. Did that? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. This next question is from a person who works at a clinic in Oroville. Uh, says, my clinic did not provide services for two days. What about private business, lost wages, slash income? You know, there was a, uh, if, if whoever wrote that reached out to me, I know there was a, uh, some information that was disseminated at one point in time, and maybe Sandy might even have this too, but for local businesses, you, you have the ability to file claims for, for damages that were associated with, the, with those two days and, and any other future loss. So hit me up, reach, reach out to me at, on a break. If you would like me to get that information, I'm happy to do so. And maybe, I'm not sure, Sandy, do you have that by any chance? Uh, yeah, I do. Okay, how are we doing on time? Should we, one, one or two more questions? Okay, all right. Um, this might be another combo answer, but we'll see. Is there a possibility of renegotiating contracts with state water contractors or having some other entity other than DWR operate the dam? Certainly FERC reissues the license, so FERC can choose who does operate the dam as far as the contracts go. And, I, and, I, and I'm not sure how many folks are out there that are capable of operating the facility, but I don't know if you have anything to say on the contract negotiations with the, with the water contractors. I'm probably not the best person to talk on that, but I mean, no. my, my understanding is that the the um, the operation of the facility, obviously, that's probably not something we're, we're probably going to comment on. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, it would it probably the, the Department of Water Resources, I believe, by state law, is the operator of the state water project, and so state law, I think, is kind of where this lies as far as who's operating. I don't think it's a FERC decision on who operates the facility. Just to be clear, they just issue the license for the operation of the facility to whoever's requiring. So, just to be clear. And we're also going to have Paul Gosselin, our, our director of water resources, is here today. He might be able to 
I'm not sure. Do you want to come on that now, Paul? Or well, you I'll, I'll be on the panel, so okay. I'll to cover some of that. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Okay, we're going to just take two more questions. Um, the area has traditionally been in resource extraction mode, like underdeveloped countries. We need to get into developer mode, where developers pay slash share costs of schools, roads, government, low income housing, etc. Agree? Well, in any, in any of the developed projects, there's impact costs, and certainly uh, those are all there's a sort of assortment of fees that are that are borne by developers who do wish to develop in any area within the county. So if we agree, uh, let's say, yes, that's what those costs are supposed to go for. All right, last question. Um, what is impact of this on Cal Parks? And the person that says front sees local. Uh, what is the impact of this on Cal Parks? Like California State Parks, I assume, is what the... Do you have anything on that, on, on state parks? No. Specific as far as the, uh, certainly the, I think the, with, the, with the water level being the level that it's at, I mean, there's limited, I think, folks going to the the, the reservoir to, to, to the water to the lake, it could be, that could be an impact on state parks. Is that where, I'm not sure where exactly the question's going. Well, and maybe it's not something that you can answer, so I, I, I don't know. You know, I, I can look into that for you. I, I can't say yeah, that's on that. Okay. Let's, um, we'll, I'll reserve the remaining questions uh, in case we have time after. And let's let Sandy Linville come up. Oh, yes. And give the story. So please welcome Sandy Linville. She is the president and CEO of the Orville Area Chamber of Commerce, and she's going to speak about Orville Strong, which began after the spillover crisis to improve economic benefits for Butte County and other stakeholders in recreation, business, and safety. And her presentation will be coming up momentarily. Um, to be Orville Strong means that we are now, as a community, taking a stand to make the dam work for us. The morning presentations, or Brian's presentation and Matt's presentation, you heard differing opinions of what DWR is doing for us and what they have promised and never done for us. So it's either three strikes you're out or the third time's the charm. The original building of the dam came with a lot of promises that weren't delivered. In 1994, we went back and said, look, the DWR is not coming through on the promises that they've made. And we're still fighting with them on that. So here we are in 17. Is the third time going to be a charm or is it the three strikes we're going to be out? So we're here to say that this time we are going to stand strong and we're going to remain Oroville strong to get the dam to finally work for us. How did we begin? On February 15th, the day after the evacuation order was lifted, Robert Bateman from Row Ro Class Industries gathered a few people together to say, hey, we need to do something about this this time. So by Friday, February 17th, we had our first official meeting. At that meeting, there were a couple of dozen business leaders and employers in town, along with Assemblyman James Gallagher, Senator Jim Nielsen, and Congressman Doug Lamalfa. So all of us sat in the room on a Friday evening to say, here it is that we want to do, here's what we want to do differently this time. Whoops, skip a slide. Today, we went from a couple of, uh, a dozen or so employers and business leaders to 129 individuals and businesses at this moment who have officially joined Oroville Strong to say we will stand together. 
We have one simple mission, that Oracle Strong will work to advance meaningful solutions, not just solutions, but meaningful solutions, to upgrade the Oracle Dam and the flood control infrastructure, as well as work on your behalf to advance programs that will strengthen the economic climate in the region, promote jobs, tourism, and improve the quality of life for all residents. Whew. No heavy task at all. Because as you've heard, this is a battle we've been fighting since 1968 when the dam opened. We are in a unique opportunity today, however, to make that happen. Because it took a crisis. It took the failure of four different modes to dewater the lake to ensure that, what, you don't flood people and then kill them. It took the failure of all four of those to bring DWR finally to the table. That's how we began. Since then, Oracle Strong has actually become part of a larger coalition. Because on that February 17th night, James Gallagher and Jim Nielsen then went downstream to the other communities that were affected. Because remember, it's not just us in Oroville who were evacuated. It was 188,000 people who all lived downstream in the inundation path. Their lives were affected as much as ours were too. So Mr. Gallagher, Assemblyman Gallagher and Senator Nielsen rallied, like we did here, different groups who have a vested interest in seeing that the dam is operated safely and properly together. We came up with three overarching categories that we are going to work on together. First and foremost, safety and security is our number one priority. What you've heard today is a lot of talk about recreation. What you've heard today is a lot of talk about revenues lost. What you've heard today is the promises that when the FERC reissues the license, you're going to see a lot of protection, mitigation, and enhancement of things. But what you didn't hear today is the talk about how is it that they are going to make our lives safe. And that's what we, as Oroville Strong, are standing strong for. There are two areas with safety and security that we, as the people whose lives are at risk by living downstream from the dam, infrastructure and operation. As far as infrastructure is concerned, we are advocating for the construction of a larger load level outlet. Now, please forgive me. I'm not an engineer. I don't speak engineer. I don't even play one on TV. So I will probably bungle this. And please, Matt, help me when I do. According to the engineers in our coalition, the construction of a larger, low-level outlet is more of a 21st century technology and standard by which reservoirs are dewatered. This will cost a lot of money. This will cost a significant amount of money. So my guess is you're going to hear the pushback from the DWR and the state water contractors to say, no, it's not needed. But again, when it comes to looking at costs, we at Oroville Strong may have a different accounting method than the DWR or the state water contractors. They use dollars and cents by which to look and assess projects. We at Oroville Strong, we look at the costs of lives of the hundreds of thousands of people who have to deal or have the risk of living downstream. That's our cost. We understand that this is costly and it's price, pricey, but it's needed and it's something that we're going to be advocating for. There are several different reservoirs around California have, who have now put this larger low level outlet in to mitigate and to dewater in emergency situations. Secondly, is we are advocating for a concrete blind emergency spillway. Now this has been an original request from that fateful uh, February day. We now know that the plans that the DWR and, and, and the design that they're doing does have a lot of concrete in the emergency spillway. So this one isn't as important because it's being addressed. 
However, the emergency spillway is not being fully concreted, just partly concreted. We are asking for Highway 70 and 99 improvements. Uh, the highways were highly congested in the emergency evacuation, keeping people in harm's way. Now I can tell you the Butte County Association of Governments, BCAG, has been working on a plan to widen Highway 70, now affectionately termed Blood Alley, given the number of accidents and safety concerns that happen on that highway. There's a plan in place. There's not only a plan in place, there's movement as a result of this. But we as Oroville Strong and we as a community need to keep that advocacy going because as always, there's not a lot of dollars, there's not enough dollars in cents. We are also asking for new roadways to provide access to recreation and to better protect access to critical infrastructure. You heard Matt talk about the plans that the DWR has to enhance the recreation that we are now looking at. What we are asking is, when people can no longer walk across the dam as recreation, but we have other levees. The levees that are, are, con are not concrete, they're not paved, uh, they're not easy. They're gravel, they're rock, and they're definitely not ADA compliant. So this is what we're asking, is just to mitigate the damage that's been caused basically because of this incident. Now let's get to operations, because this is where we, as Oroville Strong, have had our one of our one of two biggest pushbacks. We have sat at the table with the director of the DWR, the assistant director of the DWR, the general manager for uh, the state water contractors, and their deputy chief of engineering. So we have sat down at the table with those people and and, and gave them the list of what we wanted. This is the one we got the most pushback on. What we want, and we will stand unwavered, is we would like local oversight, a local oversight committee, to, to, to take a look and understand and oversee the operations and the maintenance of the dam. Why? Why do we want this? The independent forensics team released their interim report on February, or excuse me, September 5th, 2017. And they themselves said, and, and as a, to reiterate what Matt said, that the physical inspections, the actual act of going out there and looking at the dam to make sure it was okay, was necessary. It's a necessary part of the operation. It's a maintenance, but it wasn't sufficient. It wasn't enough. The second conclusion or lessons learned that they, they reported on, and by the way, this is word for word coming out of the report. Uh, the con they needed comprehensive periodic reviews of original design and construction, taking into account comparison with the current state of practice, are needed for all components of dam projects. These reviews should be thorough, taking advantage of all available information. I bolded this critical and independent, rather than relying on the findings of the past. And they should be completed by people with appropriate technical expertise, experience, and qualifications to cover all the aspects of design, construction, maintenance, failure modes, and the assets on, of the assets under consideration. The forensics team concluded, the IFT has not seen any indication that such a review for the service spillway chute at the Oroville Dam has ever been conducted since original construction. There were original design flaws that were never looked at since. Such a review would have likely connected the dots and informed the PFMA, which is the Potential Failure Mode Analysis Process, by identifying the physical factors that led to the failure of the spill service spillway chute. Now, I'm not an engineer. I don't know water. I don't know exactly what cavitation means. I don't know exactly how the water made the big chunk of concrete pop up in the service building. However, one thing that I do know in my area of expertise is in organization, 
specifically organization and change. So looking at the human factors, one thing that happens is when people insulate themselves and surround themselves with people who think like them, they don't get an outside view and they're not able to be critical. This is why we are advocating for this independent or outside local re uh, committee council. On this council, we are asking that there be subject matter experts, such as the UC Berkeley's Center for Catastrophic Risk Management. And Robert Bacon is on the panel today, and he'll be able to talk further about the CCRM and their qualifications. We need, DWR needs, that outside, independent, critical review to help them with their operations and maintenance. That's our number one priority. Our second category is the mitigation of the downstream impacts. Specifically, we are advocating for the Feather River Sediment Management Removal. DWR is working on this. However, downstream, in the Feather River Corridor, there's already a management plan. That management plan, as sometimes government plans tend to go, they get completed and then they sit up on a shelf and we sit around and we admire the plan. We would like this plan to be implemented. Also, to use this plan as a template for further upstream, to be able to manage the sediment and the corridor in Oroville and that in the area up here. We are also advocating for the Oroville Wildlife Area Project. Folks, this one right here is the easiest win with the lowest cost. So back in the 1800s, about 1849, when the gold rush started, the gold dredgers actually came in, dredged it out, put all the rubble, the gravel, the sand into a pile which it now became which has now became the Oroville Wildlife Center. This practice stopped, I think, in 1952 or 62, but the area as a wildlife area has remained rubble with cobbles and gravel and sand and such. The project the project is advocating that the DWR, in addition to using the materials that they are dredging out of the uh, river to be able to put into cement, to use this rubble, to use this gravel, to use this sand, take it out of the wildlife area, use it in the concrete. That would actually be able then to have that natural habitat restored. It's an easy habitat restoration project. They need the materials. The materials are sitting there waiting for them. What that then would do is be able to, uh, through habitat restoration, plant a native riparian type of uh, forest and grasslands that would be habitat to threatened species or endangered species. It would provide recreation enhancements, and it would be an easy win and yet we can't get them to talk to us about it. Our third area of advocacy is the mitigation of community impacts. We are asking for a professional analysis of all impacts, not only economic impacts and, and, and what has been a financial burden to the community, but also the socioeconomic impacts. And the reason why we are asking for this and we can't give you a number right now is because the, the economic impacts are still occurring. There are businesses who are suffering losses due to loss of, of recreation. And I'll talk about that here in just a second too. But also the socioeconomic impacts. In order for you, as a business owner or a person, to have been able to uh, get some sort of financial relief for what you suffered economically, you had to have filed a claim. That claim, you had six months from when the injury occurred, or when the loss occurred. That expired <coughs> mid-August. 
However, there are still businesses that are incurring those costs. And it never took into account the socioeconomic. How many people who uh, didn't go to work? Okay, we didn't go to work for a couple of days. For the most part, that didn't kill us. However, what else did you have to do? How many people were holed up in their homes for four, four days, not knowing when to go, not knowing where you're going to be able to get your next groceries? How many people had to move families, had to get families and move them here? You're incurring a socioeconomic cost. And not, we're not saying, hey, we should be compensated for this, but what we are asking for is social justice. Secondly, short and long-term recreation enhancements. Not just the promise of, oh, when the license is signed, we will. As you're going to hear from Kevin Zeitler today, who is the chairman of the Oroville Recreation Advisory Committee. Lost my train of thought. Oh, as you're going to hear from him today, the future license is actually predicated on different triggers. What does that mean? That means while DWR says, comes up here and says, we are going to infuse, once the license is signed, up to a billion dollars worth of recreation enhancements. What you don't know is that's based on triggers. So if, if X number of people come to the lake, then DWR increases or implements these enhancements. We want the short-term and long-term enhancements now because recreation in 2017 is down significantly. On Tuesday, I went to a meeting in which representatives from both state parks and the DWR said, oh, the campgrounds are full. We have more visitors than we've ever had. And I'm thinking, wow, that's amazing because we, as the ORAC actually visited the campgrounds during Labor Day and they weren't full. Matter of fact, during one weekend, there was only one or two campers in the campgrounds. Reservations were canceled over Labor Day, one of our biggest holidays. So if we wait until the FERC license is signed, we're waiting for the triggers. We're waiting for the people to come back. We're waiting. And they may never come back. I mean, how many people in here have ever had an experience at a place that was, you know, less than what you wanted? You had a bad experience there. Are you eager to go back? I, 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 I'm not. I'm guilty of that. I will make a hasty generalization that if I have a bad experience, oh my gosh, that restaurant, the service was horrible, the food was cold, I'm never going back there again. We don't want that to happen here because once people stop coming here, they're not going to come back. So that's why we're advocating for this to happen now and not waiting for the, the signing of the new license. We also are advocating for an area marketing plan. Piggybacking on what Brian said and the question about the person who said, well, is DWR going to you know, put out a series of PSAs to let people know that Butte County is safe? Um, I can tell you, we've been asking this from day one, as Oroville Strong. Uh, as the Chamber of Commerce and as a leg of advertising for the DWR, we feel a lot of phone calls and we manage the Lake Oroville website. Our phone has stopped, well, first of all, our phone ring off the hook after we came back with people asking, is it safe? Can we come there? Is it safe? Or we also heard, I'm not coming for Feather Fiesta Days because I don't know if it's safe. Then as the uh, summer progressed, our phones stopped ringing. So we got fewer and fewer inquiries, which lets us know that people aren't as interested as they were before. So we need to do something now, because like I said before, we only get one shot. Once they've decided not to come, or once they've decided that their experience was bad, they're not going to come back. I want to let you know, yesterday, I submitted a proposal to the DWR for a marketing plan and asking for funding to implement the plan. 
Thus far, the DWR's response has been, hey, you know what, we have some space on uh, 70 on the billboards, we'll give you the billboard space. Which, don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining, I think that was awesome. What that did is it allowed us to test a, a particular plan, and it's been, we've received overwhelming response. Now, we're saying, okay, DWR, now it's time for you to step up the plate so we can let the rest of the country and the world and the uh, state know that we are safe and open for business. Low cost power for Oroville and Butte County. Remember when I said that there were two things that the state water contractors and the DWR pushed back on? First was the uh, local oversight committee. This was number two. They said absolutely not. Why? Because it costs too much for them to ship the water down south. That they already pay enough. We're asking for social justice. Not only are we asking for social justice, we're just asking for them to make good on the promises they made originally through giving us some low cost power. Again, it comes out of their accounting method with dollars and cents versus our accounting method with life and quality of life. We just don't see eye to eye. And it's the end user who pays for it. So they want to keep the cost of the water as low as possible for the end user. However, what they don't realize, and what we're here to say is, yeah, that is true. It's a tremendous value for the state of California. We don't want people's water bills to be sky high. However, we in this community are the ones that bear the risk, all of the risk of living next to and underneath the nation's tallest dam. There should be social compensation and social justice for what we are doing. So there it is. These are just a few of the items that we're currently working on. Um, we are going back to the table, meeting with the new director of the DWR, again with the general manager from the state water contractors and a few others in another couple of weeks. It's going to be a long process, a very long process, but we're going to remain dedicated to it this time. Because either the third time is going to be a charm or the three strikes were out. For more information or to get details, uh, you can go to oravillestrong.org. That will kind of give you a, a resource list. Dot com. com. That'll work. <laughs> okay, okay. Not a woman help either. Um, I'll let you in on a secret. If you actually put in org, it'll take you to the dot com. We, yeah, we bought all three domains, so you're okay. Either way. So if you want more information, or even better, if you want to join Oroville Strong, you can go to orovillestrong.com and sign up. There is no cost to sign up. All it takes is your resolve to say, this time we are gonna make the dam work for us. So my name is Sandy Linville and I am Oroville Strong. Thank you, okay, so. Um, first one, there have been uh, advocacies for the 20 plus years I have been in Oroville. What concrete plans slash successes has this advocacy achieved? And there's a couple bullet points this person added. Uh, number one, presence at engineering administrative reviews. Two, implementation at state level legislation. And three, what is back at table? Okay, um, that's a long question, so I'm going to try to address it point by point, and then I'll probably... Uh, I can review the first part. Okay, the first part is successes today. Yes. First and foremost, one thing that we've done is we have coalesced together to uh, 29 different organizations to construct and submit a letter to the FERC to say, do not relicense the, the Oroville Dam. Now, while you think that's probably not a very significant win, it is in our book because we are signers and we, the Chamber of Commerce, are signers on the settlement agreement. So what we're saying is we understand that we may potentially lose some dollars, or not lose, but postpone some dollars, that we are not going to get this infusion of cash 
that comes with the signing of the license. Because we, as the Chamber of Commerce and Signers and Oroville Strong, think that lives are more important than recreation. So that's win number one. Secondly, we had a meeting with them at the table. They have been very open to the things that we've been asking, except for those two that we will, well, except for the one we will st stand steadfast for. Like I said, we're going back to the table. It's going to be a long process. Part of that's... So I think you may have answered what is back at the table. And I think there, the bullet points are maybe just examples. Presence and engineering, administrative reviews, and implementation at state level legislation. They will not let us. Uh, they, there is a law, home, Homeland Security, the, the CEII, which stands for Critical Energy Infrastructure Information. Basically, um, that says that there are certain things that are too critical for public agencies to release to the public due to potential terrorist acts. That's what they're, what they're standing behind. So we have not been able to sit down at the table to be able to uh, have a conversation at, at the engineering reviews. This is the oversight committee that we're pushing for to be able to allow them, the subject matters experts, to be able to come in and sign non-disclosure agreements to say, yes, we'll look at all this stuff, but we're not going to tell anybody about it. However, we just want input and trust. And then the third one? Oh. Oh, was that it on that one? I think you answered it. You okay. talked about, um, okay. did you talk about, you talked about implementing implementation at state level legislation and the presence at engineering administrative reviews. Did you talk about that one? <laughs> oh, implementation of state level um, legislation. Working on, working with, uh, we're not leading the charge. We're just helping support those who are. Like Assembly McDallagher's AB 1270, which actually increased the intensity and the frequency of dam inspections. Uh, don't know if it made it out of the Senate last night. I didn't look. I was up uh, partying last night at Cal's Gate for my son's 13 year old uh, birthday. So I was, uh, couldn't quite get up early enough to do it this morning. However, um, and then working with the New County Association of Government, supporting them to get the funding and to get the uh, plans through for the widening of Highway 70. Okay. This next question is um, another a bit long multi-component. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the whole question for entire context, and then I will review the first part. Why not? Okay. So, shouldn't water purchasers slash users downstream pay more to help maintain this water project, such as Orange County slash SoCal Metropolitan Water District, Kern County Water Agency, and others? Where can one find the following? What is the percent slash breakdown of money they are currently paying? Are they paying what they should to support this project? Okay, it's going... Yes. Okay. <laughs> A resounding yes, they should. Absolutely. We bear the risk. They should actually pony up and pay for some of that risk mitigation. Um, where to find it? You can actually go to uh, look at the rate cases. Each water district has a rate that case that they have to show what they're charging. So I'm not a mathematician either, but if you go through there, you'll be able to break it down on basically what an average user pays. So if you look at 25 million end users, their bill goes up 50 cents a month. Would it be a horrible impact to them? Probably not. Would it be a huge impact and infusion to us? Absolutely. You're looking at 12 point whatever million dollars a month being infused to those of us who bear the risk of living beneath that dam to compensate for social justice and to compensate for everything else and all the promises that were made. Not a problem for them. Huge, huge benefit for us. Was that the whole question? Uh, yes, that was. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Can I just do an interjection? Uh, at the legally required hearing, Cal Water said that they were basing their rate increase on the need that they saw for Chico and Orville to pay for improvements downstream to Marysville. I mean, they weren't even in the same county, they moved the city. So he claimed 
that we were getting benefits because we get cow water. But cow water is claiming the rate increases are to pay for other communities. So I think there's a lot of Absolutely. I, I think you're right. I think you're right. And, and if you look at it, and what you've heard here today is that water that stands or sits behind that dam is the 29 water district's water. So it's their water. We don't get a benefit from it. Well, we do, but it's a really teeny tiny drops in the bucket of the water benefit that we actually realize from that lake. I think that was it. I think that was it. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And remember, stand or get strong. Okay, so what we are going to do now is we are going to take about a 10 minute break just to give people a chance to stand up, use the restroom, get the blood flowing, have some food, and then we'll transition to our panel. So. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so let's move on to our panel portion of this presentation today. So up here, we have um, Kevin Zeitler, financial advisor at Stifle Nicholas and & Company and chair of the Oroville Recreation Advisory Committee. And we have uh, Bruce Spangler, president of Explore Butte County and general manager at Lotus Management. We have Paul Goslin, director of Butte County Water and Resources Department. And we have Robert Bateman, president of Roplast Industries. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to make a short presentation. And with, uh, with pastors and brokers, short is not the operative word. So we, and usually they have a hook somewhere around here, you know, they, they yank it off. Uh, uh, a little bit of, That's saw, what I'm here for. You saw the history of the, uh, of the dam. And, uh, you know, they talked a little bit about the new license and uh, the old license, if you will. The, you know, ORAC has filed uh, many, many uh, different uh, things over the years as far as the operational and especially the fluctuations. That is one of the, the most difficult parts about this. And it's a design flaw, if you would, uh, and, this, and the, the county knows this too, it's a design flaw. Very rarely will you have 32, and it was 34 slides in the blank and in the picture. But when you have uh, boat uh, docks or lawn, you know, on the lanes, you block off the lane. So what happens is that you don't really have those. So at full pool, you have 34. At the lower levels, you might have 10 percent of your full length. So. Uh, Sandy brought that up is that when people have a negative experience, they will come back. And so when you have very steep drop-offs, elderly folks, folks that have disabilities, they're not going to walk up from the lake level, especially as it drops all the way up, you know, all the way uh, back up to the parking lot. So the shuttles, and I wanted to thank uh, Matt and the DWR for putting the shuttles in, that has been something we have been advocating for years, 10 years, 15 years. Uh, also, he talked about the Lower Creek, and uh, we have been advocating for that for 10 years at, uh, at that. Now, we have a couple of serious concerns um, about this, and you County went through the cost of the, the losses, if, if you will. Um, if you look at Yosemite, uh, you see, or, or Disneyland, or whatever else like that, you see 65 to 68 percent of their revenues come through the four month period, five month period from May to September. And in Yosemite, it's roughly 2.3 million people. I hate to correct the county, we're lucky to get 1.3 million people on a best year in Oroville. And, that, and why? Because of the, the drops. So here's the things that need to be, um, this project is a dysfunctional project. It was never engineered for this, the steep drops in the water usage, and it needs to be done to, to uh, we need to do that to, to fix that. So here, as Sandy said, here are the eight items that I want you to take away. One is a consistent experience every time. Not a negative. In no other business do I know that you come in May and the lake's full, and you come two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, or five weeks later, 
and you have to walk up a football field at 90 or 100 degrees. That's not user friendly. People won't come, come back, number one. So the launch ramps need to be full, meaning all the way 34, all the way down to the low water levels. There must be consistent uh, experience, consistent usage, because we all know that there's water in the lake, right? But it's a mirage in many cases. You see the water, but you get there and it's way downhill. So what happens? We did a tour of the campgrounds in mid-August. Went up to Lime Saddle to see the campgrounds. How many people in August, on a Friday in August, one of the two major recreation months, how many people were in the Lime Saddle campground? There was a camp host. How many else? One. One out of 50 to 60 sites were at Lime Saddle. One. Why? There's a problem with the state parks registra uh, registration system right now. They show the things as full, they're not full. Why they chose to launch that in the middle of the summer, I have no idea, but we have been severely down since that point, number one. Number two is, when you ask the, the uh, folks at state parks, where is everybody? What's the problem at Lime Saddle? Because I haven't been at Lime Saddle in about 10 years. The number one thing is, when people come up and they don't have a boat, where are they going to swim? And they tell them, here's what they tell them. You get in your car, you drive all the way down to the floor bay. But, I mean, there's no swimming at Lime Saddle. There's no swimming at Loper Creek. There's really no swimming at Bidwell. So you have the campgrounds, so you can fill all the campgrounds you want until there's water access, they're not going to come and use it at that. So uh, as we talked about, um, we, we also have to deal with the replacement of the spillway. If the spillway is gone, you will need a third or fourth, preferably with a marina developed. We were promised a third marina years ago. Never, never happened. But if that 12 lanes goes, that took the pressure off Line Saddle and Bidwell and Loper Creek, which dewaters very quickly. So here's the other problem. The new management level is probably going to be 850 maximum water. Because of all the concerns about safety, we're never going to see full pool again. So you're going to manage at 850. When you manage at 850 maximum, means you go into 800 really damn quick. Number one. Number two is when you go to 775, you lose Lofer Creek unless the new extensions go through there. And, and all the other ramps become very narrow ramps at that point. So we need uh, to deal with that. Number four, we need full-time shuttles all week from the parking level to the lake level. That's, that has to be a mandated one. Bidwell Marina, like Lime Saddle, must have land access all the way down to the 640 level. We need to fix the user experience of no swimming at the major sites and at lower, especially at lower water levels, to be easier access to all facilities with the campgrounds with man-made attractive water parks or some type of a shuttle system to a floating site or something else that people can swim. Uh, the uh, swim platforms or whatever else like that. There's been really no out of the box thinking uh, in years here, which is, is the problem. It's a dysfunctional problem, which was never fixed. And so if you liken it to Disneyland, which 44,000 people come to Disneyland per day, 44,000. They have more in a month than we see the entire year here. Now, here's what's, Disneyland is only 285 acres, if I remember correctly. We have 41,000 acres. We have 167 miles of lake, and we can't even get a million tops, 1.3 million tops. So the last thing is, as they touched on earlier, 
highway safety, four lanes in two years. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Spank. I got it, I got it, I got it. No accidents here today, please. <laughs> Uh, my name is Bruce Spangler. I am the uh, president of Explore View County uh, and also the general manager of the Holiday Inn Express managed by Lotus Management. Um, I'm here to speak on the, uh, the tourism aspect of our county um, and to give you some information on Explore View County. Uh, we are a, a TBID, a Tourism Business Improvement District that we uh, put in place December 2015. All the hoteliers in Butte County came together and uh, created this, this assessment district where we collect a 2% um, assessment on every uh, guest stay in our county. We use that uh, money to then market Butte County. Um, we are just in the beginning stages of, uh, of starting the, the marketing plan after building a brand and a website and all the pieces and parts that go along with that. Uh, this year, the budget for marketing Butte County is 620 thousand uh, dollars um, so it's a significant amount of money that we're going to use to get Butte County's name out there certainly uh, uh, part of our uh, our work is to make sure that everyone knows that Butte County is a great place to come to it's a safe environment um, and that we're open for business as we've heard many times uh, today um, and so it's it's um, it's important I guess uh, for questions that you have uh, Related to tourism, uh, we know kind of the, the economic impact uh, for our area. Um, Butte County was uh, actually before the, the spillway crisis. We uh, we had some some great years, uh, two years before that, for tourism in general. I would not say that that's from leisure travel though. Those are those are for businesses uh, going on business going on here in Butte County and folks that need to stay here uh, for business. Um, when I uh, was listening to Brian's presentation today, and he was talking about some of the promises that were made in the beginning stages of building the dam, and we're talking about all those different recreational uh, facilities that they were they were planning on doing, or at least you know the talk of why we wanted to have a dam here. Um, if we had those kind of recreational facilities here in Butte County, the, our job of marketing Butte County would be so much easier. Um, having those resources, things that people want to come from, the Bay Area, Sacramento, those drive markets, um, uh, Reno, Tahoe area, having those kind of facilities in this area would provide, you know, benefits, economic benefits that we couldn't possibly imagine here. We're certainly, we're certainly very lucky here in Butte County to have the assets that we already have. Um, and so we're doing our best to market uh, Butte County and take every aspect of it, whether it be a hidden gem or something that is uh, very common and, and dear to our hearts. Uh, the festivals that we have here in Butte County, everything that we can gather together and present it with one, with one voice um, out to uh, the drive markets, to the state, and ultimately to the world as we partner with Visit California and, and other uh, type of agencies. So. Um, any questions that you have, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Um, again, uh, it's very exciting for us. We're getting ready to uh, sign a marketing deal with a uh, marketing agency here in the next couple of months that will actually start some large campaigns. Our first one is called Explorers Welcome. So in welcoming people to come to Butte County and explore all the great uh, reaches and nooks and crannies of our county and really get an opportunity to see how beautiful this is and how many a great recreational opportunities we have here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gosselin, I think that one is already on. Is it on? Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, thank you. I'm Paul Gosselin. I'm Butte County Director of the Department of uh, Water and Resource Conservation. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, one facet of Lake Orville, and that has to do with the contract uh, the county has for a portion of the water as part of the state water project system. Um, it's probably not the most exciting topic, but I think it's been raised um, in a couple of the questions about how the whole process works. So Lake Orville is part of the state water project system. There's 29 state water project contractors throughout the state. Um, we are one of those contractors. Um, five of the contractors are north of the Delta, and that is important, as I'll explain in, in a little bit. 
So most of them in the largest users are south of the delta. Um, and one thing when you hear about DWR, you know, negotiating with the contractors or meeting with the contractors, there's a state water project contractors organization um, that typically is the, the main point that DWR or others talk to, to that work on behalf of the contractors. Uh, Butte County and Plumas are not members of that organization. So there are 27 of those contractors as part of that entity, uh, but we're not part of it. So we're not um, really in on, on those discussions, even though we are a contractor and have a full contract. One thing with the contractors, um, they don't hold water rights to the lake. Uh, the water right, and this is issued from the State Water Resources Control Board, is issued to DWR. And then the, the contractors, it's like any other contract um, that you, know, you have a certain amount of uh, water. So those contracts were issued to the contractors in the 60s, and we signed on to those. Um, they're due to expire in um, around 2035 or 2037. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that later, because that was also coming into play. And, and just as thinking ahead, the system has a lot of maintenance all the time. Bonds are issued all the time to keep the system going. So anytime you refinance on your house or do a mortgage, you go out 30, 40 years. So if the contracts end, uh, short of that, you need to renegotiate your contract so you have certainty on payment. So our contract, we have 27,500 acre feet of water out of the lake as part of our contract. Um, that's out of three and a half million acre feet that's contracted. So a very small portion, and this was part of the um, work that was done when the lake was getting, getting put in. Um, so as part of the contract, we have the standard piece of that that the other contractors have. And the way it works is you get a certain piece of the pie that comes out of the system, and but you only get what's available during that year. So if it's a dry year or there's other systems going on and now they have delta flow issues they need to deal with, you don't get, typically in most years you don't get 100%, but you have to pay for the entire amount of your piece of the pie. So it's an interesting business model for them, for them to do planning. Um, so up until 2008, you know, we have the water, it's out of Lake Orville, it's higher cost water than typically what we have locally because it's a big infrastructure, there's some basic costs we have to pay. We don't have to pay transportation charges through the Delta, which is a huge cost, but it's more costly and the demand for water is more in the Chico area, Durham area. So up until 2008, we've only had small contracts with local purveyors, Delaware, Calwater, Oroville, to help supplement their water supply um, needs. And again, those are contracts with them. They don't hold water rights to any of that water. Um, 2008, the state came in, DWR, and said, you know what? Um, we had this arrangement where you only had to pay Butte County only what you used locally. Um, and the rest, they took back, we didn't have to pay, and they divvied it up among the contractors and they picked up the bill. It was, it was kind, of, um, uh, kind of a fair deal, but they changed that in 2008 and said, you know what, you're going to have to pay for the entire 27,500 acre feet, whether you use it or not, or have uh, people who can buy it. And if you don't pay, and at the time it was $1.2 million, in the midst of, remember that great recession we had, um, if you don't pay, you breach a contract and you could lose the rights, uh, your, your contract to that water. So that put us in a, in a bind. Um, and what we did, it was also a critical drought year. Um, also, we had a lot of compounding issues then. We, we put in a, a two short-term um, leases to two other contractors to pay for what we don't need to, for them to receive it, and they would pay us the cost plus a supplemental amount. Um, and that kind of got us, kind of got us um, through the hump, so we didn't have to go out of another 1.2 million dollars um, a year. A couple things that in discussion with the board, board of supervisors, is that the contract we have, this 27,500 acre feet, is a real untapped asset for use within the county. And there's a strong desire that we need to retain this find the means to convey it to areas that need in the county and not um, lose it. So coming up with a lease arrangement, which gives us retained ownership and the flexibility to manage it was a kind of a novel approach. 
and really instilled that the water here is, you know, fundamental to our communities and, and our economy and environment. Um, but it was temporary, and we still had this looming payment that was coming after this temporary uh, lease that was done during the critical water year. Fortunately, at the same time, we were also entered into litigation with DWR on our contracts um, for under what's called the area of origin lawsuit. And the five contractors north of the Delta filed suit against DWR because under state law, area of origin generally says that areas where water resides, um, the local region should have first right and access to use of the water before it gets moved to other regions. Pretty fundamental principle. We hold that near and dear to our hearts as, as policy um, in this county. So we filed suit with DWR um, over a variety of things. One, the allocation we get each year. You know, if the rain falls north of the delta, we shouldn't be subject to the lower allocation that's based upon a statewide basis. Um, so in 2013, we did settle uh, with the state on that, and we got. View County a separate allocation amount. So for in-county use, um, we get most years we'll get 100% uh, allocation. Um, but we also got the, the ability to lease um, until we get full use in the county, be able to lease um, the unused portion to um, to contractors. So we have uh, long-term leases with two contractors. This small contractors is part of the system that pay for our bill and also generate some revenue but keeps ownership for us um, till we get in county use. Um, <coughs> so looking ahead for, for long term on maintaining this, like I said, the state um, contracts for all the contractors are due to expire in 2035 and we started entering into uh, negotiations with the state. Um, we were included on that as one of the 29 contractors. Uh, to renegotiate the long-term uh, contracts. We in Plumas County brought into as part of that negotiation um, a, a principle we wanted instilled is that we wouldn't be responsible for having to pay the cost uh, for a water fix, the two twin tunnels going through the Delta. Um, for a variety of reasons. One, we get no benefit from that. It was going to be an enormous cost. Uh, the other piece is the way the project's going to unfold is going to uh, potentially decimate and cause enormous harm and damage uh, to not just Lake Oroville, uh, but to the region. Uh, they decided that they were going to kick that off to a separate negotiation um, and, and um, move it off. So we decided, Plumas and Butte County, not to sign on to the long-term um, extension of the contract. Um, they met their commitment, they met once on um, kind of on the issue of us not being obligated to pay for water fix and that was in 2014 and they haven't met since. So it's about falling into a um, black hole. And just real quickly tying in what water fix means, the twin tunnels, uh, for that operation to work, um, they're going to have to do a couple things. It's move uh, surface water rights from the water districts, all the rice growing areas, um, and take away some of the water rights to move water down. And two, they're also going to have to operate Lake Oroville at a much lower levels beyond what they're dealing with with flood control to get water to the system. Both of those are going to cause enormous harm uh, to the region. So last month, Butte County entered into filed a lawsuit um, against DWR on water fix, particularly because of its impact and failure to escape. Uh, fully evaluate the impacts on like Oroville recreation and socioeconomic impacts. Um, but long term, um, you know, we are looking at a Sustainable Groundwater Management Act uh, implementation program where we have to bring all the basins in Butte County into sustainability uh, by 2042, which seems like a long time, but it's not. Uh, we're, we're busy working through those plans. And one of the key components of that is to tap into the asset of the contract we have um, at Lake Oracle and, it, and looking at trying to work in a way to get uh, some conveyance to move that water to Durham, Chico areas and alleviate demand on groundwater basin. City of Chico is 100% dependent on groundwater. Um, the amount we have in contract is a, roughly the demand in Chico area. So um, using this 
water as an asset um, would really enhance and stabilize our groundwater basins, which would um, be critical to our communities and people with private wells and our economy. So that's the long-term plan we have um, to continue to keep the financial stability of maintaining this asset and to look to a long-term future to uh, tap into it for our communities and health. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bateman, there's also a wireless mic down there. Does that work? Yeah, it obviously does. Uh, my name's Robert Bateman, president of Roplast Industries. Uh, we came here in, I first came here in, 19, uh, in 1989. And when we were selecting a slide, site for a new business, and um, I stood on our site with Buzz Roberts, who many of you remember as a famous mayor of Oroville, and looked up the dam and I said to him, that dam, you know, is it, is it good or bad? He said two things. One, and I remember it clearly, one, it's so big and if it breaks it'll flood Sacramento, you, so you can be quite sure it's going to get looked after, right? <laughs> and secondly, uh, that uh, it, meant, it meant that we had the uh, lowest cost of uh, hydroelectricity near our plant and therefore that should be to our benefit. Well, the last one has turned out not so well. Uh, the electricity for us now is uh, twice what it is um, in, in other states at least and 30% um, and higher than ready, which gets some benefit from the dam at Chester. As uh, so far as the um, second uh, uh, thing he said was about the safety, well, we know what's happened to that. And uh, for manufacturing uh, in Oroville, um, safety is absolutely critical. And we can't, we, we, having started the business with nothing, we now employ 150. We have about $30 million worth of equipment, uh, which is well above the floodplain, but not above the level that would be inundated if. Um, if the dam is breached in any way. So uh, it's fairly obvious why I got involved with, um, with uh, trying to make sure that, that the crises that occurred in 1997, when actually it was more dangerous than this time, although people didn't realize it because they didn't realize that the emergency spillway was, um, was, was, uh, wasn't really a spillway at all. It was just a, a rim to the lake. And if that, if that had been breached in, in 97, it would have been worse because it, the, the, it was still raining, but luckily the rain stopped in time. And none of us realized that. In 97, we went on believing that the DWR was gonna do a responsible job. And I went to a few meetings and was told that we wouldn't have to worry again. And so when this happened and I went down to the plant again on, I think it was February the 7th, um, I decided then looking uh, hold, looking up at the dam because, and it would take quite a long time I think for the water to get from the dam to, uh, to down to our plant. Looking up at the dam I said look if this, this time I'm not going to give up, I'm going to support Bill Connolly who's um, fought the battle uh, right the way through and before him Bob Beeler and, um, and make sure that we, we, we um, things um, don't develop the way they have in the past again. That means changes, which most of the changes, well, all of the changes that are required, Sandy mentioned, and, um, and we don't intend to give up. Uh, and uh, it, whatever we have to do, we can say until we get independent evaluation of the dam accepted by the DWR and the water contractors, who I'm now told today actually own the dam. They, they own the car and that uh, DWR just drives it. Well, that's an interesting concept and probably correct. But it means that we're dealing with both the DWR and the water contractors and they both have to change their attitudes uh, so that um, the people who bear the risk don't uh, get some of the benefits and that, this, their, that safety is defined as um, what is safe uh, to the community rather than what is safe after the water has been delivered and making that the top priority. Um, we, I don't see many changes that have been made in the attitude uh, since, um, since the crisis, although there's a lot of words talked about uh, safety. 
So um, the other thing I, that, uh, that I've found uh, uh, very valuable is the, um, um, the, this, this Berkeley group, the, the Center for Catastrophic Risk Management, and I've become an associate member of that in, in, in a way. And they have produced an independent evaluation of the dam. It's about eight, nine papers, and I strongly recommend anyone reads them. The, they have been resisted by the DWR. Um, for instance, when Bob B, who is, uh, who is one of the most famous uh, and, uh, and experienced forensic engineer in the country, came up here, he wasn't allowed to see the dam, um, uh, because I don't know why. Uh, maybe they thought he was a terrorist, but um, it makes no sense for the DWR to resisting independent evaluations. And actually, the guy who is in charge of that who's running the in, in, independent forensic engineer uh, uh, committee, was that John French, I think he's called, was actually a student of Bob B's. And, uh, and, uh, and it's ridiculous that, uh, the, that there's so much secrecy involved in, in what should be a straightforward prof professional evaluation of what makes sense and what doesn't. But until we, as a community, and, uh, 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 are satisfied that the dam is going to be safe, uh, and the risks are minimal, then industrial development in Oroville will be very difficult. Um, and, uh, and that's the first thing that needs to happen. Um, and after that, uh, it seems, as uh, every, everyone has said, really, that uh, we should get some benefits in the dam. And, and, and benefiting industry is actually going to help more Oroville more than um, uh, recreation. Uh, the, the amount of money that flows into a community from uh, industrial jobs is a great is, is high. It doesn't mean that recreation isn't valuable, but but if we can get a program of uh, development going, which will need some uh, subsidy for electricity, that would be very valuable to the to the community. The other thing that uh, is perhaps overlooked is that um, the dam is employing what 500 people. 500 people now, and uh, we've lost a few people uh, because of the short-term benefits, and it's made hiring for people like uh, companies like ours more difficult. We offer long-term benefits and long-term career, but uh, as what happened originally with the dam, people are seduced into into going for short-term, uh, higher wages, short-term. And don't, which will go away. The jobs in the dam will go away one day, whereas our jobs won't. So, um, without uh, a different attitude in the way the dam is managed, and a much more open uh, uh, approach to what we need to know to be sure that we are going to safe, I think that the industrial development in Oroville will be uh, limited, which is sad because there's so many advantages of being in Oroville. The city has treated us extremely well. And uh, we have no complaints, but this uh, we're living in the shadow of the dam. And uh, that's going to be dangerous until, uh, for everyone until um, the attitudes change. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to get to some questions. Um, so unlike our candidate forums, you will be able to direct questions at individual panelists. Very exciting. Um, but right now, the questions I have here are um, not directed to anyone individually. Um, so I'm just going to ask the question. And I think whichever one of you feels that you can best answer it first, go ahead. And of course, all of you will get the chance to weigh in. OK, first question. What could FERC do to make DWR enforce its initial promises? Whoever wants to tackle that one first is welcome to it. Oh, go ahead. The, uh, I mean, we're, uh, Just get closer. FERC, FERC Just get the, closer. Uh, get closer, that's all. Oh, it's, no. it's still on. So yeah. FERC is, uh, uh, issues a new license. And so uh, the license is, is already, you know, once it's signed, if it's not negotiated differently, and uh, you know, at this particular point, we haven't seen or heard uh, anyone really say, let's go ahead and renegotiate that, because that would be a tremendous prop problem. Uh, it took almost uh, six years to negotiate the first license. 
So I'm going to expect uh, it would take another six years uh, if we tried to redo this again, which would mean that the economic benefits to the license and new license would not come into the area for another six years. And that's one of the, the reasons we, uh, the chamber, wanted to have a temporary postponement of issuing the license, but did not say we want to renegotiate the license. We just want to get some of the conditions and the spillway fixed, if you will. Um, but FERC, you know, they would have to change their mandate. They would have to change how they, you know, hold the licensee accountable. And frankly, my experience is it is that FERC is, is, uh, has a culture issue as bad as the Department of Water Resources and the state of California. And so don't blame the Department of Water Resources. This is a lot in the state water contractors and the state of California. They don't want to pay for anything they don't have to. I mean, would, would you, if you've got a contract, you really don't want to do that. But you have, if you have a substandard contract, you know, you've got to fix it. And as uh, Sandy said, we do not have social justice. I mean, we do not have a system that operates well for our community like it should. Thank you. Any of the other panelists want to tackle that question? Okay. Next question. Um, I have a feeling this is more directed to Mr. Spangler, um, but we'll see. What long distance walking trails are feasible cost wise around the lake? You, whoever knows, really. <laughs> well, I think that uh, in general, having uh, more trails um, and uh, giving us an opportunity to market. <laughs> more activities here in Butte County can only um, be advantageous to us uh, when we go to market and bring people to our area to visit, uh, bringing more uh, money to our area and tourism dollars. Anybody else? Okay. Excellent. Next question. Are there any representatives of the local Native American tribal groups represented in these groups advocating for improvements in dam slash recreational economic development, if anybody knows. Well, I can speak a little bit to Explore Butte County and our relationship with the, uh, the local tribes in the area. Um, we have approached uh, both of the large tribes with uh, casinos, um, uh, and they have been um, interested in, in partnering with us for marketing Butte County. Um, I think that they can see that that could benefit them and um, the tribes in general uh, for their revenue um, by partnering with us and bringing more individuals here to Butte County. Um, and so in, in our particular case, we are going to work with them and we keep them in the loop on everything that we're doing. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Do any of you know an entity that would uh, be an alter alternate manager of the dam in place of DWR, like the group that manages Shasta. If it's green, it's on. If it's yellow, if it's orange, it's on mute. Yeah, I think the, the only obvious one is the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, I think, and the, which is the federal gun to the federal dams which run uh, Shasta Dam. And Shasta Dams has its issue, but not the same as the issues that we've got here. So, but it, the chance of it changing is, is uh, extremely low because, uh, as was said, it's in the law of California. So, if we've been a vote in the legislature, and the chances of that are very low. Uh, they can't even. They didn't even pass the uh, dam inspection bill. At least, they, I don't think they did. I think it died last night. AB 270, which Gallagher promoted, which required independent evaluation of the dams and the legislature I think has buried that uh, uh, yesterday and uh, it, 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 it's, it's amazing that that would happen. If I can add to that, um, one, one thing that's been evaluated for a number of years, the Little Hoopa Commission reported on it, was to take the state water project system out of DWR and have it as an independent uh, utility um, probably regulated by the Public Utilities Commission. Um, and that has generally a lot of support, even among the, the contractors. Um, it's just a, a, a difficult thing to unravel. Um, we also have difficulties in, in 
in DWR, and you've seen this and heard about it, with sort of competing interests and, and uh, just um, staffing and manpower with all the different uh, responsibilities from flood to groundwater management to um, planning, and then you have this essentially large utility that's part of a state line department that's also regulated by another state agency, although it's in the separate secretary, you have sister agencies regulating each other, and that creates um, even some real or perceived conflict. So one um, concept is to move that entire operation off into an independent utility, uh, utility authority that would be regulated by the Public Utility Commission. Yeah, and I would think, uh, you know, something that uh, Sandy said today too, having a uh, local oversight committee, uh, whoever it is that's overseeing the, the operations, um, because things that, as you mentioned, um, also projects that are going on in the Delta, that maybe they're not taking into account the effects that we'll have here locally, and having folks on that committee that are from all different aspects of our, of our local community, whether it be for tourism, from the county's perspective, from the different in, uh, individual jurisdictions, I think it's important that they take a multifaceted look or multi-directional look at the impacts every time there is a, a, uh, a project in the works or something that needs to be done or someone that is requesting information or requesting work to be done, that uh, we have that ability to be a part of that conversation. Oh, boy, that's the elephant in the room uh, at that point. That, uh, and unfortunately, that's uh, been a 10-year, well, 17-year, uh, you know, issue. When we were negotiating the license, that came up, and uh, you know, as a federal project, that was one of the uh, uh, the issues. And primarily, what happens is is that when the dam was originally licensed. A couple of years later, there was an interesting bill called Davis Dole that was passed. And essentially what it did is moved the recreation to state parks, which uh, and took it to the general fund. So the state water contractors at DWR actually kind of walked their way away from funding a major, you know, major recreation. So our problem with, you know, and, uh, maybe our disagreement with a couple on the panel is recreation is a huge driver. And so if you have a national, if we take a look at Yosemite, there's a whole bus system that buses people into Yosemite and out of Yosemite to use the swimming, the warm water swimming along the Merced River and other areas like that. There's never been any type of bus system ever devised that I've ever heard of in, in the DWR process. So what happens is, is that if we get back the funding and, and DWR says, you know, it's a state agency, it's their problem, and it's it's kind of a funding show game, if you would. It, it's like I got mine, you know, too bad. We're not gonna we're not gonna pay for this. And the, the reality is as Sandy said, there's no social justice. Social justice would be our community gets compensated for the risk of being below the dam. One, we get the promises that we were made years ago when we would see a tram up, the, up there, a restaurant up there. We would have three marinas up there. We would have multiple millions of people come in. And when multiple millions of people come in to Disneyland, Yosemite, or any other tourism area, they do what? They leave the best dollars in the world. They're called green dollars, because they leave them and they get the hell out. Excuse my French, you know, at that point. And we love tourism dollars. Don't get me wrong, we should be a tourism magnet. There is nothing that Butte County does not have does not have that we could not market statewide. This should be the jewel of state parks because a couple reasons. One is it's not run by Department of Water Resources. The question you asked earlier, which I really didn't address, is FERC is responsible for the licensee to maintain environmental, 
recreation, flood control, and other issues. FERC is supposedly the watchdog that's not at home. FERC is, the, is supposedly, you know, we send letters and stuff into FERC we never hear about from them. So good luck if you send the community votes. I mean, good luck. Because we never hear from them. We very rarely ever hear from them in ORAC. ORAC is a 1994 mandated entity to run recreation or advise recreation for the Oroville project. We've advised up the wazoo. They don't listen. They don't do what we tell them so. So I'm going to say right now, I told you so 10 years ago, build a, an access to Loper Creek. We told you build lanes all the way down to the low water levels. We told you to do what you promised at that point. We wouldn't be in the fix right now if they had done what we had asked for. Thank you. Let me just piggyback real quick off of uh, what Kevin is saying too. Um, and uh, we talked about how you know, manufacturing is actually an extremely strong uh, economic driver here in Butte County. And I would absolutely agree with that. Speaking from the hospitality industry in Butte County, um, that a majority of our dollars um, come directly from business in Duke County, not leisure. So, you know, if we were given the assets that uh, we were promised, we would have a tourism mecca here that would provide additional dollars. Um, and so, the, I think that that's a that's a really key point. Yeah, jobs, job, yeah. revenue. Thank you. So this next card has three questions on it. We'll go through them one by one. Um, first one, how many of the 1,300,000 late guests are coming from elsewhere outside of Butte County? How is the count derived? Yes. Um, how many of the 1,300,000 late guests are coming from elsewhere outside Butte County? How is the count derived? Well, the very first thing is a very good question. The very first thing I would tell you is I just got done saying that most of the business here in our in our county, as far as the hospitality industry goes, that's not folks that are staying overnight. Those are not folks that are coming from out of the area and staying here. That's a very key part of this. So when they're counting up, you know, a million, three, a million, seven people coming through, those are most likely and most often are people that live in this area, absolutely. And so, and that's, those are the people that know where to go and launch their boat because people that are coming <laughs> from out of the area don't know where they can launch their boat or if there's water or any of those things. So majority of those visitors are coming from here locally for sure. I can actually uh, tell you roughly 50% are local, maybe more. Uh, especially uh, if correlated to gas prices too, strangely enough. If gas prices, remember when we had like a dollar eighty gas? You, you, you know, it was it was pretty cheap. You know, if you're looking, thank you, Jerry, uh, for the three oh five. And I was in North Carolina about a month ago. Gas was two oh one at Exxon. Two oh one. We drove ten days and hit one pothole. Right now, we would hit a hundred potholes in one day. At that, and we would pay 305 for gas. So when gas goes up, Jerry, people don't drive to Oroville, right? So you get it? it, it you know, you, you get it? That number two is the counting system has always been an issue for Oroville. What happens is, is there, there are car counters at, that are at the sites. And supposedly, they use a mathematical number as far as people driving up to uh, into the site. So let me take Lofer Creek, which I did tour when it was hotter than you know what. And there was 10 cars out at uh, north, the North Fork Bay. 10 cars at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, on the hottest day I can remember. Because I was going to drive down there and see how many people were, were using it. Maybe 10, 20 cars tops at that. Now, on the weekend, it gets more at, at, because there's no really warm water swimming at that. So, there's a cow, car counter that counts that. 
What they miss is, if you've got a large family, what you do is pack them into the car, and so the car counter at 2.4 doesn't work. Or they park across the, the freeway and walk on in, and it screws up the count. So we've stopped for years, they're under-reporting the counting figures. At that. So it's done by, the, the answer is it's done by an estimate on how many people per car, and it's not even uniform for the sites. Okay, second question on this card. Uh, beyond actual operating expenses for the dam, where is the money collected by DWR going? California General Fund? No, it's uh, all the money collected from the state water project charges um, stay within their accounts that are off the general fund and off budget. So it's a separate accounting system that's off budget. Okay, is FEMA redesignating the evacuation zone zones as in a uh, flood hazard area, and everyone will be subject to higher insurance costs? So I had a little trouble reading the question. Sorry, tiny, tiny handwriting. I admire it, but I can't replicate it. Um, so, is FEMA redesignating the evacuation zone, um, maybe as a flood flood hazard area, and? The question is about whether everyone will be subject to higher insurance costs if this redesignation, if, if, if you know. Okay, short answer. Moving on, this next one is also about flooding. Okay, um, this question is more worded in bullet points, so I will do a little editing. Um, recent flooding disasters, such as Florida or Texas. Um, uh, let's see. The question is, is mostly, would that impact how feds view Oroville dam costs, uh, strategy to raise the profile of the dam? I think maybe the question is about all this recent flooding, is that impacting federal money going to Oroville Dam? Uh, I'm sorry, would you repeat it? Well, uh, yeah, I, I, okay, so we've had two huge floods, Florida, Texas, 50,000 forest fires across the country. And so they passed the bill to increase the quote unquote emergency fund. But are they going to look at Orville? It's not as newsworthy now that it was not February anymore, i.e., not give us the money they said. Um, number one, I can't control public disasters. Um, number two, though, the media is very good at going to the next fire, a major disaster, and, and you're right. You, you've got a very good concern that, um, you know, when you, here's the Jeopardy question for you. West of the Mississippi, what was the largest evacuation ever in the United States? Orville, 2017, is the answer to that question, and 188,000. So that's your Jeopardy question for the week. And so a, a couple of things are piggyback on that is, is that um, number one, and this, this is kind of uncomfortable to deal with, but this disaster was not a natural disaster, okay? So in your FERC rule is rule 10C, which assigns responsibility to the licensee Licensee DWR uh, for the for the operations and issues that they had. Now, you know, we can talk about and, and Matt did a great job in you know looking at what what went wrong, but you know, for us, if you're in charge of a major project like a dam and you've got millions of people, hundreds of people living down below you. You want to make damn sure the water's there for, because you sell it, number one. Number two, it goes to 25 million people. So if the water doesn't go down to them, you think you're going to get screaming and yelling? Boy, you sure are. Uh, but they want to get by on the cheap. You know, that, that's really the issue here. And they got Davis Dolway in there to do it on the cheap. So we never got what we were promised, if you would. And so 
the issue here is going to be, will the state, will the state do what, and DWR, do what they need to do to A, make us whole, B, to fix a dysfunctional system. Now, as Matt said, either they're the most unlucky or inept folks you've ever dealt with, because you've had four major or five major disasters that you're supposed to be, you know, the experts in charge of. Now, I'm not an expert at that point, and gosh knows I've made mistakes in my life, but four, four major disasters and one which could have potentially killed 200,000 people? I mean, what, where is the, there's a culture issue that I think we talked about too. We need to have also oversight, you know, legislative oversight on the local area to make sure that we address the issue that you talk about, but also get fairness for it too. I'd just like to say something mainly about the CCRM. Uh, they produced a paper which seemed fairly uh, well argued that actually FEMA shouldn't be paying for anything because of the information they were given by the DWR uh, was not uh, correct. Uh, now, I don't know if that's true or not, but the, 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 the politics are involved. Uh, secondly, um, I'm trying to work with them to get an evaluation of the what would have happened had the emergency spillway breached, so 30 foot of water would have flowed out of an area perhaps 100 yards wide, what, 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 what would happen? It's almost impossible to visualize, and we all have our own ideas, but if we, I think it would be very valuable for everyone to have a profession, professional uh, assessment of that, so that uh, we're all looking at the same things. And I think that maybe it would have flooded Sacramento, uh, I don't know. Uh, but it would kill a lot of people, and it would affect it uh, all of our lives for many years. Thank you. Okay, this next question, uh, I believe, touches back to something Mr. Gosling said in his initial presentation. Why aren't Butte and Plumas counties in the contractors group? Um. One, they, they charge a lot of money to be a member of the group. Um, it didn't seem like that was a necessary expenditure of monies. Um, two, and I think it reflects the standing out on area of origin and trying to fight for not just the assets in Lake Thorville, but assets locally that we wanted to retain um, our independence. They have um, advocacy groups, uh, advocacy positions that are um, strongly geared towards south of the Delta, um, and that kind of kept us out. We do work with them. We do have a, um, when we can, a constructive dialogue. Uh, they've been involved in some of the finance discussions and obviously those long-term negotiations, but as a member of an association that, um, you know, is advocating more, moving more water from north and south and um, the tunnels and everything else is something that we've never been a party to. So that's all the cards that I had in my possession currently. Anyone, any cards still floating out there? Raise them up. We have a question for the mic. He doesn't have. Go ahead. Just a com, <coughs> just a comment. Um, Jim's restaurant downtown. Everybody knows Jim's. Uh, they've had a really bad summer, and this is goes along with what you folks are saying. And another thing to think about, the Hop Bra restaurant will be closing in December if business doesn't pick up. And that's a long, long time restaurant that we've had here. And just for your information, they serve breakfast, a terrific breakfast, which I didn't even know up until about a month ago. Anyway, uh, we have to, uh, the locals have to support these if the uh, tourists don't. Thank you. So I think what might be nice to do is we had a few questions left over from Mr. Murray and a couple left over from Mr. Ring. Um, we could pose those and also um, maybe just keep our panelists up here uh, if they can provide any answers as well uh, with the time we have remaining. 
Apparently it wants me behind the podium, thank you very much. <laughs> so um, I'm going to grab those questions if Mr. Perry could come up. Um, you guys stay where you are. Uh, it might be questions that you guys can answer as well. You know, We found that out um, with some of the questions from Mr. Perry. Okay. Just stay on deck. So I did keep these in order of which speakers they went to, so if I hadn't, haven't done anything crazy, they should still be uh, for you. Okay, so I can't hold too many cards at once, it goes haywire. So this is a card with uh, two questions, the second of which is meant to follow up depending on the answer. So the first question, what is the overall sale of water in Lake Oroville worth annually to the 29 contractors? Seems like it'd be better <laughs> for Mr. Oslin. I know our charges just for the 27,500 acre feet are about $1.6 million. I don't have the total amount, but it's can, they, can you hear him? Can you hear his answer? Can you hear me? Yeah. Just our portion, the 27,500 acre feet, is about $1.6 million. And there's, I think, contracts worth 3.5 million acre feet. So I, I don't have the math off my head, but it's pretty considerable. And then the follow up is the 1 billion only. Is the one billion the only allocation for full 50 years to all agencies who have agreed to the relicensing? Yeah. So the the one billion dollars that I brought up there is a that's the overall obligation that the department has for the signees. So, uh, for instance, if if a contract or if a uh, an agreement is made with Butte County, uh, that's not included in those figures that you were looking at up there. Uh, Butte being the the major. Uh, I don't want to say hold out, but the major uh, negotiation that fell through. So I don't know of any others that, that, that didn't have that. I said just yell. <laughs> Apparently this microphone is sensitive. Okay, we just got a new question. Oh, did anybody else have input on the panel on that? Anybody? No? Okay. So the question that just came says, uh, I suggest that the water contractors and state of California will never agree to give us what we what is due. We will have to take what is due through criminal and civil legal action. So I guess that wasn't really a question. Okay. Uh, no, no actual no no actual question. Okay. All right. I'll read the whole thing before I get there. What about that, Mr. Murray? About criminal and civil legal action. I wouldn't be at liberty to talk about it if it's going to go down to litigation, obviously. So, <laughs> sorry, I don't have much of an answer for that end of things. Maybe some people will be doing it. So the the yeah. the comment I will I will read this again for the benefit of the panelists. Uh, says, I suggest that the water contractors and state of California will never agree to give us what is due. We will have to take what is due through criminal and civil legal action. There are several uh, actions uh, being uh, thought about. One is by uh, the firm of Crochet, uh, Pierre, and uh, MacArthur, who successfully uh, dealt with these pg e in, in relation to the San Bruno explosions. And uh, Joe Crochet's going to be here on uh, Tuesday, I think. No, Wednesday. Um, and. Um, it's going to be very interesting because the legislative route to uh, change seems to be uh, difficult, mainly because of the governor's attitude, and um, and uh, so I don't. I think we may well have no recourse other than to take uh, uh, civil actions, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that's resolved. That take many years, and uh, people will not receive much uh, recompense from what their damage is, but they may there may well be some changes demanded in, um, in the uh, way the dams management is, is run. And unless that becomes another way, then I think we're all going to be obliged to take that route. And I'll add to, from the county, I mean, negotiation is always your first step, but you never walk away from um, the option of going to court. Um, you know, and that's just another harder conversation you have, because you bring it to court, you get um, what you 
want to do. And we went through the death of the area of origin lawsuit and settlement and ultimately came out um, with what we um, felt was right. And um, so that's always going to be an option. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that you that's a two-part question, if you will. Number one deals with the spillway, and um, you know, those will be you know mitigated underneath Rule 10C, depending on how FERC is and you know legally. So it's you know, I think that's an open-ended one. The second question you asked is on the state water contractors is really on the license or the new license. So under the old license, you know, we're gonna probably see Conditions brought back near to where they were at the signing of the license in 2001 to 2006, I think was the actual signatory. But the, the new license goes on, and, and Matt has said there are significant amounts of money that the department is going to, uh, you know, is required to do underneath the license uh, for recreation, environment, and, and all those other things. Uh, we would hope that they, you know, that the two counties and I think the tribes are the only three that have not um, have not signed on. So it's not just one entity; it's three entities and, and significant entities, I might add. The other thing is, we'll you know go back to DWR as far as being removed from the uh, the licensee. I think there's slim and little chance for that because it's a state agency. Very rarely would you ever have the state agency bring a federal agency in to run state agency businesses. So that ship probably sailed. Uh, but we can ask to have greater accountability. Thank you. All right. Um, next couple questions. Why are support projects, i.e. gravel augmentation for fish, parking lot, clearing and grading, et cetera, not going out for public bidding? Uh, we're trying to get these projects done as quickly as we can, and as part of that work, uh, specifically, um, the permitting and, and some of the other, uh, the, the bureaucracy that typically slows down implementation of some of those projects, uh, this is all, cons we're considering the impact to the emergency, or from the emergency um, on recreation, and on the environment as part of the emergency. And so we're responding with trying to get these projects done immediately so that we can immediately, you know, mitigate for those those changes and losses in, in those two fields, environmental and uh, recreation. So I don't know, maybe Kevin, if you want to capture anything else. Uh, I think what Matt's trying to say is that, you know, there are special circumstances now. Uh, the license has not been issued. So technically, uh, you know, even the supplemental benefits fund didn't have to be really, and is not fully, uh, uh, is not fully in place until you have the new license signed. But when you have emergency procedures like this, we've seen the department really move at light speed. I mean, to try and get a Lofer Creek, which was a gravel, you know, the second ramp at Lofer Creek, which was a gravel road, you know, and not even in the design plan, already have FERC approval. Uh, man, my hats are off to those, you know, to you know, the Department of Water Resources and state water contractors really pushing this through. But you do not want to, you know, we have to be careful how fast we go that we don't disrupt recreation. But uh, if we got a chance to get a lot of this stuff done in the first couple of years, I'll take it. Okay. On the issue of transparency, how will DWR be more open and accountable to public concerns about safety and maintenance issues in present and future? I don't know that I have a canned answer for that, but I mean, I think that we, sorry, have a knee-jerk reaction to walk. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the department is, is doing better. I know that there's probably going to be arguments against that in the crowd, but uh, there's been a huge release of information as far as the dam safety records, the inspection reports. I mean, there's so much paper and so much stuff that's already been pushed out on the internet. I know that they're still receiving, or there's still uh, a few things that they have to be careful with and sensitive with. Uh, keep in mind that DWR is not the sole uh, responsible agency for that. I mean, we are being guided by even the Department of Homeland Security, uh, these are nationally recognized critical energy infrastructure uh, components of the state water project. 
uh, that you know obviously Im impacts all of California and the West Coast and the economy. I mean, there's there's a huge amount of, of impact for these facilities. So I know that the transparency issue is a big deal. Uh, I work for the department. I have access to some of those things just because of what I do, uh, but. Even even I don't have access to all of those things, and and uh, it's uh, I hate to say some of those things are need to know, and uh, we will do everything we can to release whatever is is safe to do. Um, safe is a you know a soft term that I know a lot of people don't like hearing because somebody else is deciding what's safe for you to know. So I, I definitely um, understand your your worry. Anybody else, Mr. Ring? I, we can bring you in if you have any input as well. Just. You're, you're welcome to come up. Anybody need input on that? Okay. Uh, this is a question about the Aqua Alliance suit about Delta Tunnels. How will Butte County participate? This may be more geared toward the panel than... Actually, as, as I mentioned, Butte County filed our own lawsuit um, on August 21st. Uh, we also are filing an action on the uh, bond assurance filing DWR had in uh, court. And what that is, is they have to proceeding in court um, that indicates that they have the willing payers to uh, pay for the bond and we've um, also objected to that because they've um, been vague, unclear, and less certain about um, the obligations that uh, the contractors pay, and particularly our obligations in order to start paying that. So we do have our own lawsuits um, on water bills. Okay, um, I've been told that we have a represent representative from Mr. LaMalfa's office who can answer the FEMA question earlier. Um, let me find the FEMA question. Okay, this question was about FEMA redesignating the evacuation zone um, as a flood hazard area, uh, and the question was, will everyone be subject to higher insurance costs? Uh, hi, my name is Laura Page, and I'm the district representative for Congressman Doug Lamalfa. Okay, I'm Laura Page, Congressman Doug Lamalfa's representative, and as far as there's, there's no um, efforts in place right now to remap the Oroville area with respect to any type of FEMA flood zoning, so that is not in the works. And the other thing I wanted to address was uh, one of the members of the audience had discussed whether or not the disasters in Houston and or Florida would impact the funding um, for the FEMA efforts here, and that they will not, because President Trump did designate the Oroville Spillway disaster, a national disaster, which triggers the ability for reimbursement of all eligible costs. Now that's where there will be uh, some negotiations because it's going to really hinge upon the forensic final report. The response effort, the initial response effort, which to date is estimated at $274 million, which basically went through the period of May 31st, 2017. And then after 2017, roughly, it is now called the recovery efforts. But the response efforts are estimated at $274 million, and if all of those costs are eligible for FEMA reimbursement, that would mean 75% of the, that $274 million would be reimbursed. As we all know, the contract with Kiwit right now for the recovery effort is $275 million, although we do anticipate that those costs are going to increase. The recovery effort is what's really going to be coming under the microscope and Congressman LaMalfa and I, we met with FEMA and we are going to be staying very on top of this situation about what is eligible for reimbursement in the recovery process. I just wanted to, but the other disasters will not impact whether or not the, whatever is considered eligible is funded. Thank you. Um, the one last question that came in 
Jen. Um, just recently, regarding DWR, pretty short. I want to know if the heads of DWR are hired or appointed. The, so just to reiterate the question, are, are the heads of DWR appointed or hired? They are appointed. Uh, typically, the last you know five percent or something of the management tier, uh, deputy directors, assistant directors are typically all appointed positions. So. Okay, Deborah, did you have any uh, follow-up comments? I sense that you do. You're walking toward me, so. Could we have another round of applause? We have some phenomenal.